COBOL was widely used, especially for any large volume data processing, such as banking institutions, insurance companies, and many government-run systems, such as Social Security, retirement, and even pension systems. 200 billion lines of COBOL are still in use today, and that 90% of the Fortune 500 companies still have COBOL code keeping the lights on. Currently, many of the COBOL programmers from the 70s and 80s are retiring. Subsequently, there is a demand for programmers who know COBOL and can step in to help problem-solve issues as they arise. Learning, which is designed to get you acquainted with the basics, or, if you're like me, to shake out the cobwebs and get you back up and running with this powerful programming language. COBOL developers today aren't often writing any new COBOL programs. They'll be reviewing and updating existing code. So, this course is designed to review the structure of COBOL programs and provide insight into some of the code features that you might encounter. Okay. Before we get started, there are some things you should already know about programming in general. This course is designed to provide you with examples of COBOL programs that you might see in a production environment. Since most programmers will not be creating new COBOL programs, I took the approach of introducing COBOL commands and concepts by demonstration. I want to stress that this is not intended to be an introduction to the foundations or fundamentals of programming. You should already be familiar with basic principles of programming, such as defining variables, assigning data types, and using assignment statements. A major difference with COBOL is the fact that it's strictly a procedural language. Therefore, my intent is to show how COBOL can be used to accomplish similar tasks that can be found in other more recent object-oriented programming languages. In this course, we will learn about reading and writing to files, including data validation, which is often the purpose of a COBOL program. I will review syntax for creating variables and writing statements to perform calculations. Although COBOL is mainly used on a mainframe computer, there is an option available that allows us to simulate that environment on a personal computer. If you plan to use a personal computer for your COBOL programming and you want to use GNU COBOL, which was formerly Open COBOL, which is a free COBOL compiler, I've included movies that walk you through a sample installation. For this course, I'm going to be using a Windows machine, so I will start by installing WSL. WSL stands for Windows Subsystem for Linux, and I'm going to use the Linux installation Debian to set up my environment. Next, I will use Visual Studio Code as my code editor, which comes with a WSL extension and additional COBOL extensions for code formatting. So the good news is that you don't need access to a mainframe computer to complete this course, but you will have to install some type of COBOL compiler. For this course, I chose GNU COBOL. In COBOL, it's important to understand how programs are run. Programs are run using JCL, a job control language. The JCL is a name for the scripting language that's used on IBM mainframes operating systems to instruct the systems on how to run a batch job or how to start an online subsystem. More specifically, the purpose of JCL is to say which programs to run using which files or devices for input and output, and at times also indicate whether or not there are additional conditions that might require you to skip a step. In a mainframe environment, programs can be executed in batch and online mode. An example of a batch system can be processing the bank transactions through a vSAM file and applying it to the corresponding accounts. An example of an online system can be a back office screen used by staff members in a bank to open a new account. In batch mode, programs are submitted to the operating system as a job through a JCL, a job control language. This course is not going to delve into the use of JCL since I'm using the GNU COBOL installed on a personal computer. But for more information on JCL, check out this link to the IBM Knowledge Center. This site has lots of information about JCL and its uses. In order to write, compile, and execute code in COBOL, in the past you needed a very large computer, I mean large, as big as a room in your house, also called a mainframe computer, such as an IBM 360. Fun fact, that was the first type of computer that I worked on way back in 1984. The good news for us is that there are now emulators that can help simulate these actions on a personal computer. This will make our life a lot easier. I want to review the software requirements for following along with this course. You are welcome to use other products, but I've chosen to use a combination of a Windows subsystem for Linux, WSL, which you see here, Debian, which will be used to create the actual Linux installation, 
GNU COBOL, which is formerly Open COBOL. This will be used for the compiler. And finally, Visual Studio. I'm going to use Visual Studio as my code editor. By choosing WSL with Debian for setting up my Linux environment, it makes it much easier to install GNU COBOL using the Linux install commands without having to download and install GNU COBOL separately. In addition, one of the features of VS Code is the ability to integrate directly with the WSL environment, so I can edit my code and access the compiler from within the VS Code IDE. I do want to point out that all of these tools are open source and available as free downloads. This course is designed to teach programming in COBOL, so I will not be exploring the features and uses of WSL and Linux. So to learn more about WSL and Linux, I suggest you check out these two courses on LinkedIn Learning by Scott Simpson. I'm starting the process of setting my environment up with the WSL installation. Let's go ahead and follow along with the instructions on the website. From here, you can see I need to open PowerShell as an administrator and run this command. I can click on copy so I don't have to retype the command. So PowerShell run as administrator. I'm going to make the screen bigger and then I'm going to use control V to paste in that command and hit enter. The operation completed successfully. That's awesome. Let's go back over to the website. After I'm done with that, I need to choose my installation for the Linux environment. I decided to use Debian. Debian is down here. There's a link to it. But since I already have it open here in the Microsoft Store, I'm going to go ahead and click on Get. I'm going to click on Install. Now that the installation is complete, I'm going to click on Launch. This will take me into the Linux environment. I'm going to go ahead and maximize the window. I do want to point out that you don't have to use Debian for your Linux environment. You can use Ubuntu or one of the other Linux environments that are available from the WSL website. Now that the install is complete, I need to create a username and a password. So I'm going to go ahead and put Peg Fisher as my username, and I'm going to create a password. I'm going to re-enter my password, and it says the password was updated successfully and that the installation was successful. To make sure that I have all the updated information for my Linux environment, I'm going to run an update before I actually download my GNU COBOL. So I'm going to use a sudo command, apt update, and I'm going to hit enter. I'm going to enter my password again, and the update is done. That's fantastic. The next thing I want to do is run an upgrade as well. As you can see, there are some items that need to be upgraded. First, I'm going to clear the screen. Now that I've finished the update, let's go ahead and run the upgrade. But this time, I'm going to do sudo space apt-get space upgrade. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and type in clear again. Now that WSL is installed, and my Debian version of the Linux environment is up to date, now I want to go ahead and install GNU COBOL. I'm going to use Linux to go ahead and retrieve the most recent version of GNU COBOL. So I'm going to use sudo again, apt-get space install GNU COBOL. And I'm going to hit enter. I'm going to say yes to continue. Awesome, this is great news. And so it looks like GNU COBOL is now installed. So now I can compile my COBOL programs within the Linux environment. At this point, we now have our Linux environment set up on my Windows machine using WSL, a Windows subsystem for Linux, and we've installed the GNU COBOL. The last step is to download and install Visual Studio Code, which is what we'll use to write our COBOL programs. So let's scroll down. We can see here that step number one is to install the subsystem for Linux, which we did. And step number two is install Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to click on the link. And then I'm going to click on Download for Windows. I have a pop-up window that says, do I want to run this or save this? I'm going to go ahead and click Run. I'm going to agree to the license agreement. So I'll click Accept, click Next. I'm going to let it default to this location. Click Next. I'm going to leave it as Visual Studio Code. Click Next. And click Next again. And Install. At this point, we have the option to launch Visual Studio or just finish. OK, I'm now in Visual Studio. And you can see there's some new release notes here. Now notice in the bottom left-hand corner, because I launched it from within the Debian environment, it says WSL Debian. So I'm actually operating within my Linux environment. If you're not familiar with Visual Studio Code, I strongly encourage you to check out Walt Richner's course on using Visual Studio Code available in the LinkedIn Learning Library.
The next thing you want to do is see what extensions you have installed so that you can make sure that you have the COBOL extensions that will help make programming easier. So I'm going to go ahead and close my release notes. And over on the left hand side, let's take a look at the different options. We have the Explorer window, the Search window, the Source Control, Run, the Remote Explorer, and the very last one looks like Building Blocks, and that's the Extensions. Let's click on that next. Now, even though I just reinstalled Visual Studio Code, you can see that some of the COBOL themes have already been downloaded and are available for use within Visual Studio Code. If you don't have these, go ahead and download them from the Marketplace. So you can, what I have here is I have COBOL themes installed, and I also have Remote WSL, which allows me to open any folder in the Windows subsystem. So it states Reload Required. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. Okay, now I have COBOL themes from Bitlang, as well as WSL, as well as COBOL 6.7.2, which provides IntelliSense highlighting and code snippets. The good news is we're now ready to start programming in COBOL. So I'm going to go ahead and close extensions by just clicking on it again. And from the very top, I can do File, New File. And I now can start to program in COBOL. Let me go ahead and save this as a COBOL program. So I'll do Save As. And you might want to change the directory. So I'm going to go ahead and just type in test.cob for COBOL and click OK. When I do that, notice there's some lines there now because now it's going to use COBOL formatting. So it's going to identify the column numbers as we type. So in the bottom right hand corner, you can see I'm in line one, column one. And one of the things you'll learn in the COBOL syntax chapter is that columns 1 to 6 are reserved for line numbers, but then columns 8 to 11 are used for starting the program, such as identification division. Column 7 is unique because that is actually used to indicate that it is a continuation to the next line or a comment. When you come into Visual Studio, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner and you're not actually connected to Debian, you want to make sure you go ahead and open a remote window. So I can click on that little uh, less than sign and greater than sign, go up here, I can choose Remote WSL New Window. And when I do that, you'll see in the bottom left-hand corner now it says Opening Remote Session. This will open it up in the Debian environment. So now I'm programming within the Linux environment within my Windows PC. If you're new to COBOL, the syntax might seem quite different from other programming languages such as Java, C++, or even Python. Right away, you might notice that the end of the statements in COBOL end with a period instead of a semicolon. In COBOL, it's really important to start certain keywords and statements in specific column numbers. Column numbers are important in COBOL and reflect the historic use of punch cards. Let's take a look at what has to be in each of the columns. Starting with columns 1 to 6, they're optional, but they contain either sequence numbers or line numbers. I've included them here for this example, but in future programs I probably won't include the line numbers. Next is columns 8 to 11. They're considered the A margin. This is where you'll write your division headers, your section headers, your paragraph names, and your file descriptions. In this program, we have the identification division starting in column 8. The identification division must contain the program ID, but it can include some optional fields such as the author. It is the first and only mandatory division of every COBOL program. The program ID specifies the program name and can consist of 1 to 30 characters. Lines 4 to 6 contain comments. We know that they're comments because column 7 has an asterisk. This indicates that it's a comment. You might also see a hyphen in column 7, which means it's the continuation of a non-numeric literal. We'll see that later on in the course. So let's quickly review the remaining statements in this small program for Hello World. Line 7 is the environment division, which must start in column 8. Line 9 is the data division, the same thing, it must start in the A margin. The procedure division on line 11. Then we have the first paragraph name on line 12. The paragraph name 0100-start-here. We have display world on line 13. Notice that starts in the B margin, which again is columns 12 to 72. And finally, the last two statements, stop, run, and end program also start in the A margin. 
The end program is optional. If it's omitted, the program ends when there are no more lines of code. As we work through the course, I will continue to introduce additional syntactical elements. Now that we have a little bit of the syntax and the structure of our COBOL program under our belt, let's take a look at the next step, how to compile and run our programs. To do that, I'm going to open up VS Code from within the Debian installation. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the start a search, type in Debian, and I'm going to launch my Linux environment. I'm going to maximize the size of the window. So within Debian, I'm going to actually launch VS Code by typing in code space dot and hit enter. By launching VS Code from within the Linux environment, it automatically starts the remote connection. Notice in the bottom left hand corner, we have our WSL Debian. My Hello World program already opened up and on the right hand side, I have my terminal window. If you needed to open your file, you can go to File Open. What I've done is I created a folder on my C drive. So let me click on Show Local. Here's my C drive and you can see I created a folder called COBOL and in there, Chapter 01, CH01. This is where you'll find the exercise files for this course. And I'm going to start with the Hello World. On the right hand side in our terminal window, this is where I can access the GNU COBOL compiler. This will allow me to compile and execute the Hello World program. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I need to do in my terminal window though is to actually navigate to that folder. So I have to do cd space dot dot cd space dot dot again. Now I'm going to change the directory to the C drive. Oops, I forgot I have to mount it first. So let's go to cd space mnt. Now I can do cd space c and cd space COBOL. From here, I want to go to chapter one. And now this is where I have my hello world program. So now I can actually compile it using the compile command from GNU COBOL. So I'll type COBC, COBOL compiler space dash X, which allows me to create an executable and then the name of the program. So in this case, hello world dot CBL. When you're compiling, you want to specify the name of the program and the extension and hit enter. It came back with no errors, which is great. So now I can actually run the executable that was created by doing dot slash. And again, the name of the program, but this time I don't want to use the extension. So just dot slash hello world and voila, yay. We completed the time honored tradition of creating a hello world program in COBOL. That's awesome. The dot X option for the compiler, as I stated, creates an executable. There are many other options that you can use. I recommend that you check out the GNU COBOL Programmer's Guide for additional options. The GNU COBOL compiler takes the original source code and converts it from text to machine language. The next step, it takes the newly compiled object code and combines or links it with any previously written subroutines and any other object modules to produce the load module. And the last step is the execution of the compiled and linked module, which in our case printed out Hello World. Obtaining input from the user. It is often useful to obtain input from the user. In COBOL, we can use the display command that we already saw to display hello world to actually prompt the user to enter information. Then we'll use the accept command to read it in. Once we read in that information, we'll print out a customized message. So let's take a look at how we would go about this. I already have a program open. I've named it obtain input.cbl and it basically is the same code that I had with Hello World. So I'm going to use that as my starting point and I'm going to go ahead and add what I need and change what's there to be able to prompt the user for their name and then to write out a message that includes their name. Since we want to capture the user's name, we're going to need a variable for that. So we define our variables in the section called working storage and that's in our data division. So I'm going to start there. Underneath data division, I'm going to add working storage. Again, IntelliSense is great because it makes my typing a lot easier. All right, and below there, I'm going to go ahead and create a variable. To create a variable in COBOL, you have to start out with a level number. The lower the level number, which is 0, 01, that is what we call the highest level of element. So 0, 01 can be name. That's the variable name that I'm going to use, and I have to tell it what type of data is going to be stored in that variable, whether it's going to be numeric, alphanumeric, or even alphabetic. 
So since I'm going to be asking for a name, it's going to be alphabetic. So let's go ahead and use what they call the pick clause. Every variable has to have a pick clause. And the pick clause is going to define not only what type of data, but how many characters or how many numbers can be in that piece of data. And since mine's alphanumeric, I'm going to use an A. And in parentheses, I'll say 20 characters. That means that I can read in a first name that is from 0 to 20 characters. All right, that's all I really need for right now. So I just wanted to give you an example of how you can use working storage to declare a variable. And now in our main part of the program, the procedure division, I'm going to change my display message to ask the user to enter their name. So I'm just going to change this comment here to say, please enter your name. So that'll be displayed in the terminal window, and then the user is going to type in their name and hit enter. In COBOL, to read a value from the terminal back into my variable, I use the accept command. So let's go ahead and hit enter again. And this time, I'm going to say accept. And what I want to do is I want to accept whatever they, they entered into the variable called name. So I just say accept name. And finally, now to actually print a customized message, I'm going to use display again. And I'll say, it is nice to meet you, comma. Since I want to concatenate the message, it's nice to meet you, with their name, outside of the literal, outside of the double quotes, I do comma and the variable name, name. And I end with a period. All right, so this is how we might actually ask the user to enter in a alphanumeric field read it in, and then print it out in a customized message. So let's go ahead and save this. I can do File, Save, or even Control-S works. Over in my terminal window, I'm going to go ahead and compile it. So cobc-x, the name of the program. Don't forget the extension when you're doing the compiling. No errors, so let's go ahead and run it. So dot slash, obtain input. Enter your name, Peggy. It is nice to meet you, Peggy. So this is a very simple example, but it shows how we can declare a variable in working storage and also how we can prompt the user to enter in information and then we can read that information into our program. Welcome to the BMI Challenge. In this program, we're going to create a program that can calculate the body mass index of a person. For this calculation, the user must input the height in inches and the weight in pounds. In our program, we'll need variables for the height, weight, and BMI. These variables will be stored in working storage. Using those values, we'll calculate the BMI using the formula BMI equals weight times 703 divided by height squared. I've included the syntax for the statement in COBOL, so you're going to use the compute statement which is a verb in COBOL, and it'll actually calculate the value on the right-hand side of the equal sign and place it into the variable on the left. To help you get started, I've provided a starting program in your Exercise Files folder under Chapter 01 called BMI Start. Let's take a look. Here's the BMI Start program. I wanted to show you this because I'm actually using some working storage fields that we haven't talked about yet. So on line 8, I'm starting my working storage section. And I have three variables. I have weight, height in inches, and the BMI field. The weight variable and the height variable are both defined with pick clauses that say 999. We use nines when the value of the variable is numeric. And the size of the variables in this case is allowing me to go from 0 to 999. The BMI value is 999V99. Because the BMI is a percentage, when I do the calculation, I want to make sure that I include any decimal portion. So by providing the V99 at the end, I am using what they call an implied decimal in COBOL. And this will give me the decimal portion of the calculation. OK, now it's your turn. Starting after line 14, which is the first paragraph in the procedure division, the 0100 start here, you're going to add your code. Remember, you want to start your calculations in the columns 12 to 72. And you're going to want to ask the user to enter in the height in inches, to enter in the weight in pounds. Then you will use the compute statement to calculate the BMI and finally print out the result. Just a couple quick hints. In order to prompt the user, you're going to use the display command. 
And in order to read the value that the user entered, you're going to use the accept verb. So go ahead and give it a try, and then calculate a few BMIs. When you're done, check back and look at my solution video to see how I approach this problem. Welcome back. How did you make out? I hope you were able to add the code to correctly calculate the BMI of a person using their height in inches and their weight. Let me show you how I'd approach this problem. I'm going to start by adding my code in the procedure division. Remember, we have to start in the B margin, which starts in column 12. So let me move over to column 12. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The first thing I'm going to do is display a message. IntelliSense is really nice, and that's enabled since I added the COBOL extension in Visual Studio. So here I'm just going to say enter height in inches. Remember to include a period at the end of the statement. Let me move my mouse so you can see the line better. And I'm going to accept the value of the user typed into the variable height inches. Next, I'll display another message that says enter weight in pounds, period. And the same thing, accept. And this time, I want this value to go into the weight variable. Now I have all the information I need. Now I just need to add that compute statement. So I'm going to do compute BMI equals weight times 703 divided by height inches times height inches again. I'll include my period there, hit enter. All right, now the BMI field should have the correct value. Notice I didn't use parentheses on the left-hand side because the order of operations will do the multiplication first. On the right-hand side, I wanted to make sure I squared the height before I tried to do the division. So now let's display the result. So I'm going to do display, and I'm going to put out a message that says the BMI is, and I'll do a comma. I'm going to put my BMI variable, another comma, and at the very end, I'm going to include a percent sign since the BMI is a percentage value. All right, and I still have my stop run. Let me just scroll over to the left a little bit. There we go. And my end program. So over on the right hand side, notice that I'm already in my chapter 01 folder. So now, oh, before I actually compile, don't forget to save it. I've done that in a few times. So let's do control S to save. Now on the right, I can compile it using COBC space dash X space and the name of the program. In this case, it's called BMI start dot CBL. And I'll click enter, no errors. Okay, now I'll do dot slash BMI start. And it says enter the height. So let's say the person is uh, 5'10", which would make them 70 inches tall. And maybe they weigh 150 pounds. Their BMI is 21.52%. All right. You can try a couple more. Let's try at least one more. Let's say that their height this time is only 5 feet 9 inches, so that's 69. And let's make them a little heavier. We'll make it 185. And they have a higher BMI of 27.31%. If your program doesn't look exactly like mine, that's totally fine. Everybody codes slightly different. The important thing is that you came up with the correct results for your BMI. One of the things that might be a problem if your values are different than mine is to make sure you have the parentheses around the height inches squared variable, or the height inches times height inches. Well, I hope you had fun with the BMI challenge. Here is an updated version of the BMI calculator. This version reads input from a file, calculates the BMI, and then prints a report of the results. Now, I will review the requirements for reading and writing to files later in this course, but for now, let's take a closer look at the data names used in this enhanced version, starting with the input output section. Here, under the file control, I have created names for the two files that are going to be used in this program. These file names are used in the program and they are created using all letters and a hyphen. Hyphen is the only special character allowed in our user defined names. The file name BMI file is used throughout the COBOL program and it is assigned to a file name that exists on my computer, bmi-input.dat. Next, on line 11, we have another file, print-file. This is the output file for this program, and it is assigned to bmi-report.dat, which also exists on my computer. In addition to file names, we use data names to represent fields of data. 
where a field is a piece of information. In the file description section on line 15 where it says FD BMI dash file, this is where I've created data names for each piece of data on the input file that will be read by my program. Let me scroll down a little bit. Here we see on line 19, person dash name. The person dash name is made up of two fields. On line 20, we have last name, and on line 21, we have first name. Below that, we have height dash inches, and below that, we have weight. When I scroll down a little further, we'll see working storage. Working storage is where I have my variable that will hold the calculated BMI. Now notice I'm using a prefix of WS. This is on line 31. So WS dash BMI, I am using this prefix to indicate that this variable is from working storage and not a field on my input file. If we look down a little further, you'll see on line 41, I have my detail line. The detail line, which is used to write to my report file, also has data names that are prefixed with DET to indicate they are part of the detail for the report. This is a common practice in COBOL naming standards. It is important to choose meaningful names, but just like other programming languages, COBOL has certain rules we need to follow when selecting these names. User-defined names can contain letters, numbers, and a hyphen, but a programmer supplied name may not begin or end with a hyphen. The data names may not exceed a max of 30 characters, and reserved words may not be used as programmer supplied names. Data names must contain at least one letter, and paragraph names can contain numbers, letters, and a hyphen, but they can also be all numeric. Let's go back to our BMI program. I'm going to scroll down a little further so we can see the procedure division. As you know, the procedure division is where the bulk of our programming will occur. And this is where we have our user-defined paragraphs. It is helpful to number the paragraphs for easier readability, such as you'll notice on line 60, I have 0100-process-records. I chose to start with 100 because that left room for any additional paragraphs that I might need before or after this paragraph, and it turns out I did need to add 0050-open-file. As I stated, the paragraph name can contain numbers, letters, and a hyphen. The paragraph names can even be all numbers. Just like the data names, you want to make sure you choose meaningful paragraph names. So for example here, I have 50 is open file. I have on line 60 is process records. Line 69 is the paragraph that will actually calculate the BMI. We have paragraph 300, which is write the heading line. 320 writes the detail line. Paragraph 400 is the last paragraph and it performs the activities that are needed to stop the execution of the program by closing the two files, stop run, and end program. In COBOL, variables are defined with a level number such as 0, 01, 0, 05, 10, etc., a data name such as WS item 1, a picture clause such as PIC 999, and an optional value clause such as value spaces. To start a new data name, you must specify the level number, which represents the hierarchy of data within a record and identifies any special purpose data entries. This is usually 01 for the field description entry and group level items, 02 to 49 represent elementary items, level 66 is reserved for the rename clause, which identifies an alternative grouping of data items, 77 is for items that cannot be subdivided, and we'll see a lot of level 88, which is used for condition name entries. We'll see additional examples of all of these throughout the course. Let's take a look at some data fields in our program. To talk about data types in COBOL, I've decided to use another program I created called sales.cbl, which is available in your exercise files folder. In this program, I use level numbers and picture clauses to describe the nature of data fields. As you can see, on line 26, I have an 88 level data name used to identify when the end of file is reached. It's called end of sales, and it's given the value high values. High values is a keyword in COBOL, and it's often used to indicate the end of file. Next, when you see a picture clause that uses nines, this is used to indicate a numeric field. For example, on line 27, I have my salesperson ID, which is a level 05, and it has up to five digits, so it's pick 95. 
we will use X's for all fields that include alphanumeric characters, which can include letters, numbers, and even special characters. On lines 29 and 30, I have my first two fields that use pick X 20. One is for the last name on line 29, and the other one is for the first name on line 30. Notice on line 28, I have an 05 level salesperson name with no pick clause. That's considered a group name. Underneath are the two parts that make up the salesperson name. I can refer to the salesperson name, which will give me both the last name and first name, or I can access the individual data items within salesperson name. Sometimes you might see all A's, which means that the field is strictly alphabetic. The size of the data field is also very important. You want to make sure to use an appropriate size for each data field. The size is identified by the number of nines, the number of X's, or the number of A's. For example, you can see here on line 31, I have X5, which means that the region can be made up of five letters. Below that, we have yearly sales, which is made up of six digits. I'm going to scroll down a little bit so we can see the variables defined in working storage. On line 40, I have a variable WS total sales, which is defined as pick 910. In working storage, your variables may be used to hold intermediate or final results of calculations, so it's really important to choose an appropriate size. If the variable is too small, data could be lost. In this case, I made WS total sales pick 910. It's used to keep a running total of all the sales read in from each salesperson's record. If the size is too small, it might misrepresent the total sales. Starting on line 48, we see the heading line used for my report, as well as line 57, which is the detail line. Did you notice the filler entries for the report record definitions? Filler is a keyword, and it's used to define a field that is not referenced anywhere else in the COBOL program. It represents a placeholder. In addition to the name and picture clause for the size, each data variable can also have a value clause, which is another keyword, such as value spaces or value zeros, which you see here in lines 43 to 46. The value clause initializes the contents of a data name within the working storage section. On line 50, we see a value clause that specifies salesperson name. This is a literal that is used for the heading line in this report. Finally, when creating reports, the picture clause has additional values that can be useful to format the output. They are called editing characters. We'll take a look at those later on in another movie. It was a common practice in the 1980s to store numbers in what they call a packed decimal format to save space on a file. In COBOL, we use the data usage clause COMP3 to indicate a packed decimal. Packed decimal format means that each byte of storage, except for the low order byte, can contain two decimal numbers. The low order byte contains one digit in the leftmost portion and the sign, whether it's positive or negative, in the rightmost portion. Here's an example representing the decimal number 21544. You can see it only takes up three bytes, which saves a lot of space. By using COMP3, we were able to compress numeric fields into roughly half their size. This is especially useful in situations where we had to add a field to an existing file and there wasn't much space left to play with. If you convert an existing field to COMP3, you have additional space for other values. COMP3 is also used to avoid rounding issues that can occur when binary numbers are used to represent decimal fractions. This is especially important in systems that process large volumes of financial transactions, such as banking, credit card services, etc. COMP3, or packed decimal fields, is a carryover from the days when only mainframes existed and memory and disk space were vital and very expensive. If you think about it, one could almost save half the space if the record contained mostly numeric data. When you specify COMP3, you are generally asking the compiler to implement any arithmetic operations as decimal arithmetic, as opposed to using the binary arithmetic operations that are inherent in today's computers. Let's switch back to the VS Code Editor and change the working storage field that we use for calculating the total sales. As you can see, on line 40 is where we have our working storage total sales, which right now is taking up a value of PIC 910. We can change that to COMP3 to reduce the size of the memory that is required for this variable. But before we make the change, let's run the program to see the total sales. So I have my terminal window open on the right. I'm going to go ahead and compile the program, COBC. 
dash X, use the name of the program, it's called sales.cbl, and now I'm going to actually execute it, dot slash sales, and now I need to open up the file. Since this is writing to a file, I don't have anything to display. So I'm going to open up my report file. And it's called salesreport.dat. Notice, here's the total on line 14. Not formatted very well, but you can see it is a quite a large number. It is 1,779,400. Let's go back over to our sales.cbl. Now, when we update the field to add the COMP3 usage, it shouldn't change any of the information, but internally we will be saving space, and large programs can run more efficiently. So I can just change this total sales to add COMP3. This time, I'm going to go ahead and compile the program again. Now I'm going to run it. As I stated, it shouldn't change anything, but it's a good idea to check. So let me open up salesreport.dat, and you can see it's still the same amount, 1,779,400. In our little program, the COMP3 is not making a big difference, but if you have a whole lot of transactions, it will definitely increase the speed of running your program as well as save on memory. In addition to COMP3, you might see other usage definitions such as COMP1, COMP2, etc., but the most common is COMP3. In COBOL, we can have both numeric and non-numeric literals, where a literal is an exact value or a constant. The rules for numeric literals include a numeric literal can be up to 18 digits long. It can begin with a leading or leftmost plus or minus sign, and it can contain a decimal point, but it may not end with a decimal point. A non-numeric literal is enclosed in apostrophes or quotation marks as specified by the compiler. And finally, a non-numeric literal may contain anything, including spaces, numbers, and even reserved words, but it cannot contain another apostrophe. In addition to literals, COBOL also has something called figurative constants, and they're reserved words that name and refer to specific constant values. Here are some of the more commonly used figurative constants. We have high values and low values. We've already seen high values as an indicator to indicate the end of file. We can use zero or zeros, we can use space or spaces, and we can use quotes. Let's go back to our sales program to see how we can add a numeric literal. We've been asked to update our program to allow us to print out a commission value for each of the sales representatives. So we'll need to include a commission rate, which will be a numeric literal. From there, we'll calculate the commission amount, and for now, I'm just going to display the amount using the display command to the console. Let's start by adding the commission rate into our working storage section. Since we're going to have more than one variable for working storage, I'm going to change this WS total sales to add a group item, and I'm just going to call it WS fields. And then I'll have the WS total sales as an elementary item underneath my group item. So now what I need to do is I need to add a variable WS dash commission rate. Since the rate is probably going to be a decimal value, I'm going to go ahead and give it a pick clause of V99, but now here's where I can give it a numeric literal of value of 0 0.03. All right, next I need to have a variable to hold the commission amount once I calculate it, so I'm going to do WS dash commission AMT. I need to make sure this is big enough to hold the commission amount, so I'm going to do pick 910, but I'm going to make it a comp 3 as well. That way I'll save some space. All right, I have the variables that I need. Now I just need to update the procedure division to calculate the amount of each commission. You might have noticed here, though, in the working storage section under WS region sales, I'm using some of the figurative constants of value zeros. On line 52, I use value spaces, and there's also the non-numeric literal of salesperson, region, and yearly sales. Okay, let's scroll down to the procedure division. I'm going to go into the process records paragraph, and right below the move yearly sales to the detailed yearly sales, I'm going to add my code to actually compute the working storage commission amount. So I use the compute verb, WS amount, and the amount is going to be equal to the WS commission rate. Now, since I have my terminal window on the right hand side, I want to conserve some space, so I'm going to go to the next line. So I'm going to put the time symbol, but then I'm going to hit enter. 
And since I didn't use the period to indicate the end of the statement, COBOL allows me to wrap this statement around. So now I'm going to multiply that times the yearly sales, and that will give me the commission amount for each person. So let's go ahead and display it so we make sure it's getting calculated correctly. So I'm going to do display. I'm going to display the first name of the salesperson, comma, a space to make sure that the number is not right up against to their name, and finally, the WS commission amount. OK, let's go ahead and test our program. Before we compile it, we want to make sure we save it. So we can do File Save, or we can do Control S. I'll do File Save. On the right-hand side, I need to compile it. So COB, C, dash X. And notice, I did name this Sales with Commission, so I don't confuse it with just my regular sales program, dot CBL. OK, now I can run it. So dot slash sales with commission, hit enter. There we go. OK, so now we see that the commissions printed out for each of our salespeople. We have Peggy earning 2550 all the way down to Jung Woo, who earned $27,015. In the example program so far, such as the sales.cbl, we've seen how to use the picture clauses to format input in working storage fields. But one of the major uses of COBOL is its ability to write reports. In this example program, we did have a report that included a heading line, a detail line, and a total line. But let's take a look at the report that got produced. I'm going to open the report in my Exercise Files folder under Chapter 2, and it's called Sales report.dat. As you can see, there's no formatting for the numeric portion of the report, and it's actually kind of hard to read. If I wanted to, at a glance, say what was Patty Schilling's yearly sales, it's very difficult to actually read the numbers, but it looks like 123,000. Also, on line 14, there's this random number. It's not even evident that that is the total sales for all of the salespeople. So, this is actually a very poorly formatted report. Let me show you what this report looks like with some formatting. So again, in my Chapter 2 folder, I'm going to open up edited salesreport.dat. I think you'll agree that there's a huge difference in the readability of this report. First of all, I've separated out my column headings, so it's easier to see the report data versus the column heading. I've included a date on the top right-hand corner that indicates the date the report was written. I've also included floating dollar signs and commas in the yearly sales fields, on line 15, I've added the words grand total, so I now know what that number is. And I've also included the fixed dollar sign and check digits in the grand total. These are a few of the editing characters that you can use in COBOL. Let's take a look at the list of all the editing characters. Starting in the top left-hand corner, I start with a capital Z. A capital Z in the PIC clause indicates a zero suppression. We've seen the use of the floating dollar sign and also the fixed dollar sign. We can use a comma, which will be printed if a significant digit appears to the left of the comma. We can use an asterisk for a check protection. We can use a zero to print out a zero every time, or a B to print out a blank. Many financial institutions will use the CR for credits and DB for debit. And finally, we have the plus sign for a positive number and the minus sign for a negative number. Now that we know some of the editing characters, let's take a look at the code that I used to produce the formatted report. Let's switch back over to Visual Studio. This time, in the Chapter 2 folder, I'm going to open up saleswithediting.cbl. Let's start with the Working Storage section. The first thing I did on line 40 was to add fields to capture the current date. We'll take a look at the function from COBOL in a second. But as you can see, the function returns both the date and the time. I'm not really very concerned about the time, but I will use the current year, the month, and the day. Let's scroll down a little further so we can get to the formatted part of the report. Line 60 is my first heading line. The big difference here is just the inclusion of the heading date starting on line 68. Notice on line 70 and 72, I'm including filler so that I can have a slash that will appear between the month, the day, and the year. I'm going to scroll down again. Heading line 2 just includes dashes to separate out my column heading from my report data. And now we get to the detail line on line 85. I didn't change anything with the salesperson's name or region, but for the detail yearly sales on line 91, notice there's a lot of dollar signs there, but that provides a floating dollar sign as well as commas. 
It makes the yearly sales amount much easier to read. And on line 94 is my total line. In the total line, I added the words grand total and also included the fixed dollar sign, commas, and check digits. The check digit or check protection character appears in the grand total line and it's used to avoid blanks between a fixed dollar sign and the first significant digit. Now that you've seen the formatting of the report, as I stated, it's often helpful to include the current date in a printed report. Fortunately for us, we can use a function or a method that already exists in the COBOL library to retrieve the current date and time. Let's scroll down to the portion of the code where I'm using that function. It's in my procedure division, and it's in the section that writes the heading line. On line 136, I have move function current date to the WS current date data. Remember the definition of the working storage current date data that I showed you earlier. From here, I take the working storage current month and I move it to the heading month. I move the day to the heading day and the year to the heading year. On line 140, I move the entire heading line to the print line. And then on line 141, I'm using the verb write to write the print line after advancing one line. Let's take a final look at the report with this new formatting. So again, I'm going to go to chapter two. I'm going to open up the edited sales report.dat. And I'm, again, I think you'll agree that this report is much easier to read. It's even easier to identify the grand total as 1,779,400. So it's important to become familiar with these editing characters so that when you write the report or if you're editing somebody else's report, you know what they are and how to use them. Welcome to the next challenge. For this challenge, we're going to be creating a commission report. You can start with the Sales with Commission COBOL program that's in the Exercise Files folder under Chapter 2. The first change we'll make is the commission rate. We're going to change it from 3% to 5%. I want you to note how easy it is to change this value since we created a numeric literal in working storage. This way, you don't need to search the entire procedure division to look for instances of the commission rate. Next, Instead of displaying the names and amounts to the console, we want to create a report of commission amounts. So you're going to create a separate report file. Use the sales report file as a model. This new report will also include a total amount of all commissions. In the Exercise Files folder, there is a sample layout for creating this report of sales commissions. Use the layout as a guide to format a report header and detail lines. Use the editing characters that we reviewed in this chapter and make sure you verify the amounts and check for any logic errors. Okay, so this is your challenge. I do want to give you a hint though. You will need to add an extra working storage variable to keep track of the running total of all commissions. Pay close attention to the formatting for the numeric fields in the report and make sure that working storage field has enough positions to hold the total of all the commissions. Most importantly, have fun with this challenge. When you're done, come back and check your solution against mine. Have fun! How did you make out with this challenge? Remember, just like everyone uses language a little differently, every programmer writes code in a slightly different manner. I'd like to show you my solution. It's available in your exercise files folder under chapter two, and it's titled sales commission solution.cbl. I'm gonna highlight the changes that I made to the original sales program. Starting with right here in the file control section, on line 20, I'm adding the new report that I need to create so I have select commission report and I'm assigning it to the file name commissionreport.dat. Remember, that's the name that will be on my computer. Let me scroll down a little bit. In the file section, I need to give this file a file definition. Since this file will contain a report, I really only need to define one group item. So on line 41 is my file definition for the commission report and on line 43 is the group item that's just commission print line and it has 132 characters. That's pretty standard for any report. All right, let's scroll down to working storage. Here's where we had to make a change with the commission rate. As I stated, it was pretty easy because on line 48, it was 0 0.03 and I just changed it to 0 0.05. I didn't have to search for it anywhere in the procedure division. The next thing I needed to do was add a new variable, which I have on line 50, which will allow me to accumulate the total commissions for all the salespeople. All right. The next big change is in the headings. Let's scroll down again. Here I have heading line one and heading line two. 
I use the sample report layout available in your exercise files folder under chapter 2 to try and identify how many spaces I needed between each of the values. So here you can see I have the first name, the last name, the commission, and the commission again for heading line 1, and then below that will appear what's on heading line 2. So it'll actually put name, name, rate, and amount. All right, let's scroll down to heading line 3. Heading line 3 includes some dashes to separate my headings from my data in the report. And finally, if I scroll all the way down to line 118, this is the commission detail line. This is where I'll actually have variables that will represent the first name, the last name, the rate, and the commission amount. A couple things to point out here. On line 124, I have a decimal point in front of my 99. Remember, that's an editing character that will always print a decimal point in front of the number. On line 125, I have a filler that prints out a percent sign. And then finally, on line 27, I'm using the floating dollar sign to make sure that I print out a dollar sign next to the commission amount. In the commission total line, which starts on line 129, I actually have the words total commissions that will print out, as well as the total commission value, which again has floating dollar signs. All right, the procedure division is next. Let's scroll down. One thing that is easy to forget in the procedure division is to make sure that you open up your file, and you need to open it as output. So since I already had open output print file, I'm just going to add the commission report. Next, when I process each sales record, that's where I'm going to calculate the commission and write out the detail line for each of the salespeople. So let's scroll down. On line 156 is where I'm computing the commission amount. 158, I'm adding the commission amount to the total commission, and then I'm going to move the first name, last name, rate, and amount to my output line, and I'm going to write the commission line. When I'm all done processing the sales file, let me scroll down, and right below my end perform in this paragraph, I'm writing the total line, which is the total line for all the salespeople, and I'm also calling a new paragraph to write the commission total line. I decided to write the heading line for the salespeople and the heading line for the commission report in the same paragraph. So on line 172, where I have my paragraph 0110, I have write heading line. It starts by writing the heading line for the sales report, but then starting on line 177, you can see I'm moving heading line 1, heading line 2, and heading line 3 to the commission print line, and then I'm printing those values. Let's scroll down a little bit more, because I did add a new paragraph, 0125. 0125 is actually going to move the detail line, the line that has the name and the commission amount, to the commission print line and then writing that line to the report. As I stated earlier, I've added a new paragraph, 0135, which starts on line 198, which is write commission total line. Here, I move the total commission to the total commission field on the print line. I move the total line to the commission print line, and then I write the print line after advancing two lines. Scroll down a little bit more. In the stop run, again, don't forget to close your commission report. So I added on line 205, close print file, comma, commission report. So those are the changes that I made. Again, your program might look a little different. But let's take a look at the output that gets produced from this code. Here's my new commission report. You can see that adding the heading lines and the dashes to separate the heading from the data really makes the report easy to read. I have all the names lined up. Right now, everybody earns the same commission rate of 0.05%, and I have the commission amount. That floating dollar sign and commas definitely make a difference in the report. Then line 16 is blank because I said that I wanted to print the total commissions after advancing two lines. So line 17 says total commissions, and it has the total, again, with floating dollar signs and commas. I hope you had fun with this challenge. And if your output is slightly different than mine, that's totally fine, as long as it's easy to read and you've verified all the data. Again, making sure especially to watch out for any overflow and make sure your variables are big enough to hold the total commission. You might have noticed that COBOL is kind of a wordy language. As a matter of fact, COBOL uses the English grammar word verb to describe the commands available for performing tasks in COBOL. We've already seen several of these verbs, such as open, close, read, and even compute. For this video, I have a new program that I want to use as our guide. It's called salesdatavalidation.cbl, and it's available in the Exercise Files folder under Chapter 3. Because COBOL normally processes extremely large amounts of data records, it's often necessary to run any input files through a validation program first 
to make sure all the records are valid. In this program, I'm reading the sales.dat file, which is similar to the one we used in Chapter 2. But in Chapter 3, I have a copy of that file where I've made some changes to the incoming data to make sure some of the records are invalid. This program then checks each input record field for validity and then writes the good records to a new file for subsequent processing. This was a common practice in COBOL programming. The program also creates an error report identifying any bad records from the file that need to be fixed and processed during the next run of the program. Before looking at the verbs in this program, let's take a quick look at the error report so you can see what I mean. In the error report, you can see the first record has an invalid character in the ID. It should be all numeric, but it has the letter A. So on the right-hand side, if I scroll over a little bit, you can see it says, Employee ID was not numeric. The next record had an invalid sales amount. And finally, the last record had an invalid gender identifier. All right, let's go back over to our COBOL program. To talk about the verbs in the program, I'm going to scroll down to the Procedure Division. But you might want to go back and look at the working storage to see where I've added some of the error messages. In the Procedure Division, starting on line 122, we see the familiar verb, open, where we're opening our input file, sales file, and we're opening our output files, new sales file, and error report. On line 124, I've added an initialize verb to set the working storage date to zeros. The initialize verb is used to initialize a group or elementary data item. When this is used, numeric data items are always set to zeros, and alphanumeric or alphabetic data items are set to spaces. Below that, we have the accept verb, which allows the program to get data from the operating system or directly from the user. An example of obtaining data from the operating system is the next line, accept WS date from date. Note, when you're retrieving the system date this way, it will return the value as YYMMDD format. Next, we have the move verb. The move verb is used to move data from one data field to another. It can be used with both group and elementary items. When it's used for group items, we use the move corresponding. I think it's important to mention that data will be truncated if the receiving variable of a move is too small. If the destination is too large, it will fill it with zeros or spaces. Keep this in mind when working with COBOL. Data overflow is not often captured as an error, so always make sure you allocate correct space for your variables. The last verb that I want to point out in this program is in the read sales record paragraph. Let me scroll down a little bit. In the read sales record paragraph, we have the read verb, read sales file, at end, set end of sales to true. We also have an end read, which indicates that this is the end of the statement. Some of the verbs in COBOL have corresponding end verbs. The read is one of those verbs. Another one is the if statement. You'll see if and end if. I'll point them out as we go through the course. In addition to verbs that allow you to initialize, display, accept, read and write, and move data, we also have verbs to perform calculations. Let's take a look. We'll start with the adverb. This is used to add two or more numbers and store the result in a destination variable. I've created a table with some variables to show you how it works. So I have three variables, a, b, and c. They each have a starting value of 5, 7, and 1. After executing the first statement in the table, add a to b, notice what happens. a stays 5, but b is now the result of adding a to b. It changes to 12. Next, we have add a to b giving c. This allows me to retain the initial values of a and b, but then to create a new variable c, which is the sum of a and b. The next one is a little different. It says add a space b to c. What happens here is it adds the a variable 5 plus b, which is 7, gives me 12, and it adds it to c, which was 1, and so now I have a 13 for c. Below that is add a to b space c. This time I add the 5 to the 7 and I get 12 for b. I add the 5 to the 1 in c and I get 6. And finally, I have just an example so you can see that you can just add a number to the variables. So maybe it's a counter. I can say add 1 to a space b space c, and they all get increased by 1. Next, we have the subtract verb. Let's look at the format for the subtract verb. I've added another variable d, because there are times where when you're subtracting, you might actually have a fourth variable. So let's do the same thing. Let's look at the first row. 
subtract a from b. So b was 7 at the start, but after I execute that statement, it subtracts 5 and I get 2. Next, we have subtract a space b from c. So if we add a and b, right, that's 12, take it away from c, 12, 20 minus 12 is 8. The one below it allows me to retain my initial values for a, b, and c. It says subtract a space b from c, so again, that would be the 8, giving d. So this time, the only thing that changed is the variable d. And the last one, again, shows how you can subtract a number. In this case, I just subtracted 10 from two of the variables, c and d. c is now 10, and d is now 0. Let's move on to multiply. Multiply uses the keyword by. So the first line says multiply a by b, giving c. Again, 5 times 7 is 35, but the only thing that is changed in this example is the c value because we have another variable to hold the result of multiplying a times b. But the next one, multiply a by b, puts the result back into a. So the next one shows that the variable a has 35 after the calculation. And finally, the last one says multiply a by 3, giving b and c. So this time, I do 5 times 3, and I put that value into both b and c. All right, the last one I want to go over is divide and divide uses the keyword into. So divide 2 into c. This time c was 20. After the calculation, it's 10. We can do divide 2 into c giving b, and that will allow me to retain the initial value of c, but now it changes the value of b to be 10. And the last one is similar to what we might see in Java, a modulus division. This one allows me to get the remainder. So it says divide 3 into A, giving B, remainder C. So we start with the letter A. We divide it by 3. 3 goes into 5 evenly one time. So that gives me the value for B. From there, we say, okay, what's the remainder when I divide 3 into 5? I still have 2 left over. So in this case, my remainder is C. So now C has the number 2. If all of this is a little confusing, have no fear. The next verb I think you'll really like is the compute verb, and it is used to write arithmetic expressions in a form that we're used to, using the operators plus, minus, times. Let's take a look at an example. First, I'm going to use some of those computational verbs, and then I'm going to show you the difference in just using a compute statement. Let's take a look at finding the length of side C of the Pythagorean theorem. Using the verbs in COBOL, I'd start by saying multiply A times A to get A squared. Then I'd multiply b times b to get b squared. Then I'd have to add them together to give me c squared. And we know that Pythagorean theorem, I need to take the square root of both sides to be able to get to the value of c, which is the length of side c. So then I would have to use the compute verb and say c is equal to c squared raised to the 0.5, which is a square root. All right, let's take a look at the alternative equation. Compute c equals parentheses a times a plus b times b. Order of operations will make sure that a squared is added to b squared, and then I'm raising the whole thing to 0.5, which means take the square root. I think you'll agree that's a lot simpler. The format of the compute statement is just as important. You start with the resulting variable on the left-hand side, and you need to set it equal to the equation like I did here, compute c equals. As I stated, remember your order of operations and use parentheses as needed to dictate an alternative order. Okay. I think it's important to also just see how this looks in COBOL. So let's switch over to a, a very small program that I have that computes the length of side C using Pythagorean theorem. Here's the program. It's very small, and it's located in your exercise files folder under chapter 3. It's called Pythagorean theorem.cbl. If we scroll down, you'll notice on lines 21 to 23, I have my working storage fields, which will represent the sides A, B, and C. On line 27 is the start paragraph which says perform 200 find length of C. In that paragraph on line 35, I print a message to the console and ask the user to enter in the side of length A. Then I ask for side B. And finally, I calculate the value of C using the compute statement, compute WS-C equals WSA times WSA plus WSB times WSB. Let me scroll over a little bit all raised to 0.5, which will find the square root, and then I print out the result. Let's take a look at the program in action. 
So I'm going to do dot slash Pythagorean theorem and hit enter. We'll enter in the length of side A. Just make it easy. I'll make it 10. The length of side B, I'll make 20. And we can see that the length of side C for a right triangle using 10 and 20 is 22.36. There are definitely more verbs, but this is the short list of verbs that you will probably encounter and need the most. We often have to make decisions every day. For example, if it's raining, then I want to take an umbrella. This is an example of a conditional expression which evaluates to either true or false. It's either raining or it's not. Programming languages work in a similar fashion. They use an if statement. If some condition is true, then execute some statement. Sometimes we want to include an else. If some condition is true, otherwise execute some other statements. In COBOL, we don't use curly brackets to denote the start and stop of a block of code but we can use an end verb to help identify when an if statement ends. We can use an if and an else and then an end if. Not only does this help make sure that we're ending at the right spot, it also makes it easier to read. Kobo also allows for nested if statements. This is where an end if really comes in handy. Other conditional expressions in Kobo that are really useful are some special relational conditions. For example, we can test to see if something is numeric. If it is alphabetic, if it is alphabetic upper or alphabetic lower, we can check to see if a value is positive or if it's negative. We can use the relational operators AND, OR, and NOT. These tests are helpful when we read from a file and we want to check the data integrity of the values in the file. Next, let's take a look at some more conditional operators that allow us to compare two items. If one item is greater than the other or is less than, Notice we don't have to use the words, we can use the symbols. We also have is equal to. One thing to point out, if you're used to other programming language, they might use two equal signs. In COBOL, it's a single equal sign. We can say is not. We can say is greater than or equal to. And again, the symbol makes it a lot easier. Just use the greater than or equal to symbol. And same thing with the less than or equal to. There's one more conditional verb that I want to point out, and that's the evaluate verb. This is a lot like a switch statement in other programming languages. We evaluate some variable, and then we can have an end evaluate. For example, we can evaluate to true when the region is equal to the word east. In that case, I want to add yearly sales to my east total. I would have other statements that say when region equals west, south, north. Then I do have a catch-all. I have when other. In that case, you might want to just add it to a generic total. And finally, I have the end evaluate to indicate that my evaluate statement is done. Now, let's return to our data validation program and take a look at some of the if statements that are already there and then add one to make sure the region is a valid region. This is my sales data validation program. Let me scroll down a little bit. In paragraph 150, I actually call another paragraph 170 to validate the region. Right now, paragraph 170 is just checking to make sure that the region is alphabetic. But it would be nice to go the extra step and check to make sure that it's one of the four allowable regions, east, west, north, or south. So let's add that code here. I'm going to say if region equals east or west or north or south. If it is, then I'm good. One thing that I want to point out is the implied that the region is in front of each one of these. This is a little different, again, than other programming languages. I don't have to say if region equals west or region equals north. I can just say if region equals west or east or north or south. If it is, then it's valid, so I'm just going to say next sentence because I don't want to do anything. But if it's not, so I'm going to add an else. Then I'm going to go ahead and move no to my valid record switch so that I know to write this one out to the error report and not to the new list of valid records. And I'm going to move the invalid region message to my detailed error messages. And finally, I'm going to write that message. So write print line from detail line after advancing one line. If you forget that, you will actually lose whatever was there. It'll write over top of it. Okay, and that's the end of the if statement. So this time, I'm going to go ahead and explicitly identify an end if. 
again, this helps for readability as well as to ensure that your program is stopping where you want it to stop. All right, let's run the program. So first I have to compile it. I'm going to save it. I'm going to do Control S. Then over on the right, I'm going to compile it. So I'm going to use my COBC-X and then the name of the program, Sales Data Validation.CBL. Doesn't look like I made any typos, so now I can run it. So dash dot slash sales data validation and hit enter. It's a little odd because it doesn't give you any messages, but remember that means in this case that it ran and it produced this sales error report that I already have open. So let's click on it and take a look. I'm going to close up my terminal window because I don't need that anymore so I can see more of the report. As you can see, now it has four different records that are invalid. And here we can see that the program worked because now we have a additional record for Regina Young that says the region is invalid because it has N-O-R-T and not the word North. It's important to remember that COBOL is a sequential programming language, which means that it starts with the first paragraph in the procedure division and it continues to execute each command until it reaches a stop run. There are situations where you might need to redirect the execution of steps in a program. One option is using the GoTo command. Although there are not many situations where it's useful to use the GoTo command, there is one. For example, in our data validation, if the incoming files, if we encounter too many invalid records, it might be that the wrong file is being input into the program. So if the data in the file is corrupted, it makes sense to stop. Let's go back to our sales validation program. I've actually created an invalid sales.dat file that all the records are invalid. So instead of processing the entire file, it makes sense that if I encounter, let's say, the first five records are invalid, I'm going to stop the program. Okay, let's scroll down to the working storage section. In working storage on line 55, I've added an indicator that says WS bad records. I'll add one to this variable every time I encounter an invalid record. If I reach five invalid records coming in from the file, it's time to stop and take a look at the file. All right, let's scroll down to the procedure division. I'm going to go all the way down to the paragraph 0150 validate sales. This is the paragraph that actually checks to make sure all the fields are valid. And then on line 167, I say if it's a valid record, then I write it out to the sales detail file. Well, now let's add an else statement here. What we can do is we can now say else. If it's not valid, then I can add one to my variable WS bad records. And I'm going to use the end verb end if to indicate that the if and else is done. Next, now I got to check and see if the bad record is greater than five. So I'll add another if statement that says if WS bad records is greater than five. If it is, I'm going to display a message to the console. That way I know to look at the file. So I'll display a message that just says too many invalid records. And if that's the case, I want to stop the program. I don't want to continue performing the validation on any more records. So at that point, it does make sense to have a go to statement. So I'm going to have go to, and I'm going to go to my stop run paragraph. Go to stop run. And there's no else in this case because that, the else will just continue through the program. So I'm going to add an end if here. And now I want to scroll down to the 0200 because it's important to note that instead of just stopping the program, before I actually do the stop run, I'm going to close the incoming sales file. And I'm also going to close the new sales file and the error report. It is important to make sure that you open and close your files correctly. So this was one example of where you might want to use the go to command. So far, our programs have been relatively small, but trust me, most COBOL programs are extremely lengthy. So it is really helpful to break your program up into manageable pieces of code or paragraphs. It helps make the program easier to debug and to maintain. It is important to understand that the perform statement is similar to the go to statement that we just saw, but the perform statement transfers control to the paragraph and returns control back after execution of the paragraph. The go to transfers control and continues from that point to execute the remainder of the program sequentially. It is also possible to have the program execute multiple paragraphs using the perform through syntax. The perform through can help streamline our code. Let's take a look at how we can update our sales data validation using the perform through. Let me scroll down. Again, in paragraph 150, validate sales, you can see that we are performing several paragraphs in a row. 
So I can actually reduce the code here by simply adding one statement that says perform. And I'll start with paragraph 0160, which is my first validate, through. Now sequentially, I'm going to go through paragraph 180. This is, again, why paragraph numbers are really important. So I'm going to say I want to go through from validate ID all the way through validate gender. Now I can delete these other lines. I don't need all of those perform statements. This will actually go ahead and perform the paragraphs from 160 all the way through to 180. It allows you to instruct the program to execute several paragraphs in order and then return back to the next statement. Let's go ahead and compile the program. I'm going to use Control S to save it first. And over on the right in my terminal window, I'm going to compile it. COBC X, and then the name of the program, sales data validation.cbl. And now we can run it. Again, we do the dot slash and then the name of the program without the CBL, because that will execute the class file. And you can see that it's carrying over my too many invalid records from my last movie where I actually used the go to command. But let's take a look at our report. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the error report. So sales errors.dat. And you can see that we have several different types of errors. We have employee ID errors, we have sales amount errors, and we even have invalid gender. So it's definitely performing all of the paragraphs from 0160 through 0180, but it definitely streamlined our program. As we're starting to see, the perform verb in COBOL has many different variations. The perform through allows you to perform a block of code or even another paragraph until some condition is met. A very common use of perform through is for processing records in a file. The program can perform through a sequence of steps until the end of file is reached. Let's look at our example here. This is a car sales program, and you can see on line 127, I read the first record in the car sales file. At end, I set the end of sales file variable to true. I've added on line 130 a check to make sure the file was not empty. So if I encounter end of sales file right away, I'm going to stop the run. Otherwise, I'm going to perform through paragraph 200 through 210, which will allow me to process the sales record and read the next one until end of sales file is reached. Let's scroll down and take a look. You can see that process sales is followed by 210 read next record, where it reads the car sales file again. And this time at end, it's setting the variable end of sales file to true. There are also times when you know exactly how many times you need to execute a block of code. A good example of this might be if a data validation program is used, it might create a file that contains a header with the total number of records that it processed correctly. We can then make sure we process the exact number of records in the file in the actual program. Let's change our car sales program to start by reading a record header. We'll add a new record that contains the number of records in the file. All right, let me scroll up to the very top of the program. And you'll see we're reading in the file called carsales.dat. In my carsales.dat, let me open that up. We can see that the header record states that there are 10 valid records in this file. So let's go back over to car sales. So now we can use that and we can use the perform verb again and we can perform some number of times. In this case, we can perform the process records 10 times. All right, let's scroll down. Before we take a look at the procedure division, let's look at the data division. Notice under my 01 sales record, I have my start of the file as on line 18, 02 salesperson name, which we've seen before. But this time I added on line 21 a redefines of the salesperson name to include the number of records. On line 22, I have a variable called num records, and it takes in an integer value that has up to five positions. So that'll read in the number of records. We can use the redefines to rename a space as long as we're not trying to use that space for two purposes. So once I read the header record, then I won't use the number of recs anymore. I'll go back to using the salesperson name. All right, let's scroll down to our procedure division now. And let's make our changes. I'm still going to read the very first record on line 127, but this time I know that that first record has a variable that will tell me how many records are in the file. So instead of processing sales through 210 next record until end of sales, I can change this and I can say we are going to perform 
the process th sales through the next record, num records times. That is the syntax to indicate that I want to perform these two paragraphs a certain number of times. And in our case, based on the input file, we're going to do it 10 times. Nothing else has to change except for I do need to scroll down and at the top of the process sales, I need to read the first record now. So instead of actually reading the next record, I'm going to do it at the beginning of process sales because I need to read the first sales record since the very first record was the header record. So here I'm going to do read car sales file into sales details. And now I don't have to worry about the end of file indicator. So actually I can come down here and I can get rid of this paragraph 210. Let's go ahead and do that. And I'm going to go back up and instead of processing through 210, I'm just going to process n times. All right, let's save our file and let's compile it. Over on the right in the terminal window, I'm going to compile it using the cobc space dash x space carsales.cbl. All right, I didn't make any typos, that's good. And let's run it. All right, if we open up our file, we should be able to see a report. So I actually create a sales report and it is called car sales report. There we go. And we can see that it read all 10 records. It printed out the quarterly sales as well as the totals. I do want to point out that this is a technique that was popular with many companies that were processing extremely large files. They would also have a check at the end to make sure the header matched the number of records that were processed. Welcome to the next challenge. There's a high probability that you will encounter a situation where you have to enhance or update an existing program. This challenge is about creating a sales report. For this challenge, I have provided a starting program that reads in pet store transaction records and prints out the details and the total of all sales in the file. You can find the starter program in the Exercise Files folder under Chapter 3 labeled Pet Sales Challenge.cbl. Part of the problem with the current program is that the file format was recently changed to allow the customer to purchase up to three items. Originally, it was just one item per record per customer. Another problem is that the current program only displays the report to the console window, but we need to create a report that can be printed. So you need to update the program to generate a report file. Your challenge is to convert this program into a program that can read up to three items for each customer, print a subtotal, and then at the end, print a total of all transactions from the file. Before starting, let's take a look at the transaction file and the starter program. I'm going to switch back over to Visual Studio. Let's start by taking a look at the transaction file. As you can see, it's called PetStoreSales.dat. It starts with a customer ID number, followed by the last name, first name, and then the first item that they're purchasing. Let me scroll to the right a little bit. You'll see we have the purchase amount for dog shampoo, it's $13.95, followed by the quantity. So 00001 is the quantity. This particular customer is actually also buying a dog collar. And there's the price and the quantity. And finally, they're buying dog food. And you can see some of the customers are purchasing one item, some are purchasing two, and some are purchasing three. All right, let's take a look at the starting program. There is one thing that I wanted to point out. Notice in the file section here on line 19, you can see the way that I'm handling the three occurrences of the new items is I have a pet item occurs three times. This will allow me to be able to access each pet item separately using what we call a subscript or an index value. So take a look at the starting program and take a look at where pet item is defined. Now, let's scroll down a little bit. I don't think we've talked about how to access this type of item. In COBOL, it's a little different than C++ or C Sharp or even Java because the first index value is actually a 1, where in most current programming languages, it starts at a 0. But notice here on line 83, I say move description, and I give it the subscript value or the index value of 1. And I'm moving that to the description field. I have move price, move quantity. So right now, I have this set up to just take care of the very first item. So we could run it the way it is. Let me just go ahead and compile it. And we'll take a look at what happens when it runs. Like I said, 
this particular version will just print everything out to the console. I must have spelt something wrong the first time. All right, I'm going to move this over so we can see more of the report. And you can see the report printed out the items, the price, the quantity, and the total in the very bottom. It prints out the total quantity and the total amount, which is all well and good, but it's only for the first item for each customer. So again, your challenge is to update this program to be able to read in all three items and also create a report. Let me show you an example of the report that I created. I'm going to move this over so you can see more of the report. And you can see that when you read that same file in, but you write a report, this is what it should look like. On line 7, I have the name of the customer, the quantity of the items they bought, and the subtotal. And if we scroll down, you'll see at the very end, I have a final quantity, a final total. Okay, I hope you have fun with this challenge. And when you're done, take a look at the solution movie to see how I solve this challenge. Have fun! Hi, welcome back. How did you make out with the challenge? I hope you had fun. I'd like to show you my solution to the challenge, but I want to remind you again that everybody programs a little differently. So yours might be a little different. The first thing that you'll see in here on line 9 is that I've added a pet sales report and I assigned it to the pet sales report.dat. We saw this in the challenge, but let's take a quick look. So this was my goal, to be able to print out a report based on the transactions coming in from the file. I wanted to list the description of the items that the customer was buying and then have a subtotal with the customer's name, the quantity, and the subtotal amount that they purchased. All right, let's go back over to the program. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. One thing I had to do is add on line 25 a pet sales report and a print line to be able to write a report rather than print to the display. In working storage, you'll probably have added a few items yourself. I added WS index. I'll use this to loop through the items for each customer. You can take a look at the heading lines and the detail lines by going to the program PetStoreSolution.cbl in your Exercise Files folder under Chapter 3. I'm going to scroll down to the Procedure Division. In the Procedure Division, don't forget to open up your output file. So in line 104, I have Open Output Pet Sales Report. Then, let's scroll down to the process items. That's where most of the changes occurred. As you can see, every time I read a record, I need to start that index value back at 1 again. So on line 122, I say move 1 to the WS index. I also reset the subtotal for the item cost and the item quantity for that customer. I move the last name to the detail field, and now I'm using a perform n times, right? We know we can use the perform verb to execute a block of code a certain number of times. So line 125 is exactly that. I say perform three times. And inside there, notice each line does not have a period because it will perform all of these statements each time it reads a new record and it wants to process those three items the customer has bought. So I move the description using the WS index to the detail description. I compute my totals. On line 138, I add my quantity from the record coming in to my subtotal for this particular customer. On line 140, I move the item total to the detail item total. And then finally, I print out that detail line. I add one to the WS index. Let me scroll down a little bit. And then it would go back up to line 125. And it would do the second item and then the third item. Once it performs this subset of code, it gets down to the end perform after three times, and then it moves the subtotal to the subtotal line, and it prints out the detail subtotal line. Let me scroll down a little more. And then I actually have another print line to print out those dashes to separate the details from the subtotal. And notice on line 153, we go ahead and read the next pet sales record until end of file is reached. We'll scroll down a little bit. I didn't change anything in the print total, so that should be the same. And then the only other thing is in the stop run, make sure you close your pet sales report. Now, over here on the right, let's go ahead and compile this. And I'll run it. And we'll see the report, pet sales report.dat. And it hasn't changed. We could update the data. So let's say, for example, if we wanted to change this first one, let's make it Fisher instead of Smith. I can do that. You can add records to it. 
And I'm just going to leave all the items the same. I'm going to save that over in the terminal window. Now all I have to do is run the program. I didn't change any of the code. All I changed was the input file coming in. So now if I go to the sales report, it now says Fisher on line 7 instead of Smith. Okay, well I hope you had fun with this challenge and that the solution that I used makes sense. Don't forget you can find a copy of the solution in your Exercise Files folder under Chapter 3 under PetStoreSolution.cbl. As we've seen so far in this course, files play an important part of COBOL programming. Reading and writing data is an essential part of almost every program. Your program retrieves information, processes it, and then produces the results. Examples might be data validation and report writing. Before delving into the file types and access methods, let's review a few helpful terms related to file processing. We'll start with the smallest piece of data, which is a field. A field refers to a specific piece of data, such as a first name, a customer ID. Think of it as a label for a piece of information. It can be data, or it can even be a key, a primary key or a secondary key. Next, multiple fields or collection of fields is stored in a record. And records can be either a physical record, which is where information exists on a physical device. Depending on the file organization, the data might be one contiguous physical record, but then it's actually broken up into repeating logical records, which brings us to the next term, a logical record. And finally, a file is a collection of related records. When working with files, we need to understand that there is a difference between file organization and the access methods in your program used to process the files. We're going to start with the file organization. Depending on the input-output devices, your file organization can either be sequential, line sequential, indexed, or relative. It is important to decide on the file types and devices to be used when you design your program based on your program's needs. One of those devices is called DASD, or Direct Access Storage Device. DASD used to be expensive, so programs sometimes would avoid DASD by using tape processing. But the advantage of DASD is that it provides greater flexibility and speed. The device type upon which you choose to store your data could affect the choices of your file organization. Sequential-only devices limit organization inputs but have other characteristics, such as the portability of tapes that might be helpful. Let's move on to the access methods. The first method that I'm going to talk about is QSAM. Requests to the operating system for the storage and retrieval of records from an input-output device are handled by QSAM, which stands for Queued Sequential Access Method. QSAM arranges records sequentially in the order that they are inserted to form sequential data sets. QSAM anticipates the need for records based on their order. The system organizes records with other records, and to improve performance, QSAM reads these records into storage before they are requested. This technique is known as queued access, hence the name. Next, we have VSAM. VSAM stands for Virtual Storage Access Method. VSAM, on the other hand, arranges records by an index key, a relative record number, or a relative byte addressing. VSAM is used for direct or sequential processing of fixed length and variable length records on DASD. Data that is organized by VSAM is cataloged for easy retrieval. If you need to process records randomly, use VSAM indexed or relative file access method. Reading files with a sequential organization is probably the most common access method for COBOL programs. These types of files can be read as input, they can be used for output, or even I.O. I have opened an example program called employee.cbl that is located in the Exercise Files folder under Chapter 4. This program is designed to read an employee file, keep a running total of all the salaries, and write a report of the employees and the total salary. To read the file, we must start in the Environment Division. In my program, my Environment Division starts on line 4. Next, we have the Input-Output section, followed by the File Control. As you can see in the example, I have declared a SELECT statement to assign the file name that will be used in the COBOL program, Employee File, to the file name on my computer, in this case, mfile.dat. The mfile.dat is located in the same directory as my COBOL program. I do want to point out that if you're working on mainframe programs, the file organization type will most likely be sequential instead of line sequential. Let's take a look at the mfile.dat, 
I specifically made this file sequential and not line sequential to show you the difference. When we first open up mfile.dat, we notice it looks like there's only one record, but actually it's one record followed by the next, etc. The COBOL program knows where the start and stop is based on the file definition. Let's go back over to our employee.cbl. Let me scroll down just a little bit and notice in the data division on line 14, under the file section, we define the employee file. See, it has the same name as the select. And this tells the program how big the file is. So it knows that every file has the values listed here. It has an employee ID, employee name, start date, salary, department, and gender. And then it starts all over again. One thing I do want to point out, though, is that mainframe COBOL programs connect to their external file in a slightly different way than what we're using here. Not the file definition, but the actual select statement. In a mainframe program, the external physical file name is attached to the file name in the program using JCL, or job control language. Here is a partial JCL that shows how to attach the name MPIN to the actual physical name of the file that might be located on DASD or tape. So here we have MPIN DD DSN dataset name equals SYSADM dot employee dot data comma disposition equals share. In a mainframe program, we would now say assign to MPIN instead of what we have here on our COBOL program where we say assign to mfile.dat. Okay, let's get back to reading the file. Now that we have the file name defined and as well as the file definition, let's scroll down to the procedure division to see how we actually open the file and start reading the records. So I'm going to scroll down to line 106 is the start of my procedure division. And in the paragraph 0100 read employees, the first thing I do is open for input the employee file. When you do open a file, especially a file for input, it's always a good idea to check the result of the open command to make sure there were not any errors, such as trying to open a file that does not exist. So what I've done here is I've added an if statement that checks the file check key to see if it's not equal to zero. If it is, that means that something went wrong when I tried to read my file. On line 111, I display non-zero file status and then I followed by the file check key, which will tell me what the status is. And then I go to end program. In order to use this file check key, we need to actually assign that back up in the environment division. So let me scroll back up. You might have noticed this. But in the environment division on line 8, I added a new statement. File status is file check key. Every time we open the file, whatever the file status is, it'll be stored in the file check key which is defined in working storage. Let me just scroll down and show that to you. Right here on line 62, I defined a file check key of pick x2. And then in the procedure division, I checked to make sure that the file did not get anything other than zero as a file status. All right, let's run the program. I'm gonna click Control S to make sure I save everything. And over on the right, I'm gonna use the cobc-x command to compile it. And now I can run it by doing dot slash employee. And the only way we can tell it ran is by opening up the empreport.dat to see our employee report. All right, that looks good. All right, before we end this section on reading sequential files, I do want to show you what would happen if maybe there was an invalid file check. So an easy way to check that is if I go up to where I assign the file, if I accidentally typed in the wrong name, like mfile2 instead of just mfile, I'm going to go ahead and save this, Control S. I'll recompile it and I'll rerun it. And notice, I'm going to make the terminal window a little bit bigger. Notice now we have non zero file status 35 and file not open status equals 42, emp report.dat. Well, the file status file not found makes sense, but you might not realize that the file not open error is because of the order of operations in which I open the files. So let's take, take a quick look and notice that in the first paragraph here, I open the input file on line 109, but I don't open the output file for employee report until line 115. So if the input file had an error, I would never actually open the employee report file, and that's why we're getting the second error. 
In this example, we saw a file status 35, but you might be wondering what are some other file statuses that are available? Well, it's pretty easy to go out to a search window and search for a COBOL file status table. And you'll get something like this. And you can see here, there are many different codes that you might see. 00, zero is what we want, successful completion. But if I scroll down, you'll see 35 says open file not found. So it's a really good idea, especially when you're opening a file, to check for the file status. And one more thing, don't forget to close any files that you opened. Now that we've seen how to open an input file and write an output file, I wanted to show you also how you can open a file for input-output. There are times where you might want to be able to actually update the existing records in a file. In this example, I'm going to take the employee file. And recently, this company was taken over by another company, and all the employees have a new start date of July 1st, 2020. So all the information stays the same, their employee ID, obviously their name, um, what department they're in, and the gender are all the same, including their salary. But we do want to change the start date. So let's take a look at how we might do that. We still have in our environment division on line seven, we still have select employee file and assign it to mfile.dat. And I'm using the same file that I used for the other exercise. Although I did actually create a folder 0403 in the chapter four exercise files folder so that I could have a separate copy of the employee file. And my goal is to, instead of have the start dates that were there, I want them all to start on 7-1-2020. All right, let's go back over to our program. Notice I did call it employee update. So actually, let's go ahead and change the name here. I like the name to be consistent with whatever the file name is. It would not give me an error, but I think it just makes more sense to do that. All right, so this is an employee update program. And I've left the report there as well, just to make it easy for us to look at the report to see the new start date for all the employees. All right, so let's scroll down to where we had to make the changes and most of them are occurring in the procedure division. I didn't change any of the definitions or any of the working storage. On line 108, under 0100 read employees, notice instead of open input, I say open I-O, the employee file. I want that to be an input output file. I'm still checking for the file status. None of that changed, but I did add on line 117, perform 0150 update start date. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna read the entire file make the changes. Now notice when I come back from the update on line 118, I'm closing the employee file and reopening it just for input so that I can go ahead and continue to process the file with the new dates. All right, so let's scroll down to 150. Here's paragraph 150. And the first thing I do is read the first employee file record. I then perform a block of code until end of file. I move 2020 for the year 0701 to the start date. Now notice I'm moving it to the field that exists in the file definition for the employee file. And then I have a rewrite command. So instead of write, I'm using on line 142, rewrite empty details from empty details because I just want to write the record now that it has the right start date. Then I read the next record on line 143. At end, I set end of file to true, and then I end my read. And then once I'm done performing this for all the records, I go back up and return control back up to line 118, where I, again, I close the employee file, and then I continue processing like we did before. All right, let me make sure I save this, control S, and I'm gonna go ahead and compile it. I'm compiling the employee update, that CBL, in the 0403 folder. And now I'm going to execute the code. So employee, and you saw the employee.dat file. So now we'll do employee update. And it looks like it ran. So let's look at the emp file.dat. Well, I can see right away that Joe Smith does have a 2020 7-1 start date. And if I scroll over, it looks like Peggy Fisher does. But let's go ahead and open up the report just to make sure everybody has the new date. So I'm gonna to go to open file and I'm gonna open up. Notice I'm in 04, whoops, I'm in 0402. I'm glad I looked. I wanna to go to 0403 and I'm gonna open up the employee report. There we go. Everybody has a start date of July 1st. 
So the ability to rewrite an existing record is also an important attribute of COBOL. In many of our examples so far, we've been reading sequential files and writing out reports, but COBOL is often used to generate files that are input to other programs. For example, this program is used to generate a payroll file that will subsequently be read by a program that prints the payroll checks for the employees. The input to the program is a line sequential file containing the employee information, including hours worked and hourly rate. Let's take a quick look at the employee file that's coming into the program. So on line 7, I have select employee file and assign to mfile.dat. When I look at mfile.dat, we can see there's eight records, starting with Joe Smith, and Joe Smith was hired in 2002 on May 24th. Following the hire date is the hours worked, which in this case says 040 for 40 hours. And finally, it has his hourly rate as 1575. All right, let's go back over to our payroll program. In the file control section, we also declare on line 11 a second file. I have select payroll and assign it to payrollin.dat. The organization is line sequential. And the name of it is payrollin.dat because it's going to be input to a second program that will actually print the paychecks. So let's scroll down a little bit. In the data division, I have the file description on line 16 for the employee file. The employee details record is made up of the employee ID, the employee name, the start date, the hours worked, hourly rate, department, and gender. Let's scroll down a little further and we can see the file description for the output file. The file description for the payroll file includes the employee ID, the first name, the last name, the calculated pay amount, and the department. Those are the only two files that I have for this program, so the next thing is working storage. In working storage, I have a file check key, which will allow me to check the status when I read the employee file, and I've added another variable on line 46 that represents the employee count. A program like this is very important to make sure that the number of records coming in, the number of employees, matches the number of records processed. And then we'll also take that number to know how many checks we're going to print. So that will be very important as well to say, OK, I processed, in this case, eight employees, and make sure that we only print eight checks. All right, let's scroll down a little further. In our procedure division, in our read employees, line 51, we're opening our input file, and line 52, I'm opening for output the payroll file. I initialize the variable for the employee count, and then I check the status to make sure that I was able to open successfully the employee file. On line 60, I read the first employee, and then line 63, I go and process all the employees. So let's scroll down again. In paragraph 200, I move the data to my payroll file. On line 71, I compute the pay amount, let me scroll over a little bit, is equal to the hours worked times the hourly rate. And on line 73, I'm actually writing the record to the payroll file. Write emp payroll. I add one to my employee count and I read the next record. Once all the records are processed, I go down to paragraph 900, where I close the employee file and the payroll file. Again, it's really important that you make sure that you close your files when you're done with them. Line 84, I print out the number of records processed and we stop run. Over on the right, I'm going to go ahead, let me clear the screen, and let me go ahead and compile the program just to make sure I didn't make any changes that are not saved yet. So I'll save the code, Control S, and then over in the terminal window, I will compile it, C-O-B-C dash X, and then the name of the program. In this case, employee pay dot CBL. Okay, everything looks good there. Let's run it, so dot slash employee pay and we see that it processed eight records. Let's take a look at the new file that was created. So I have to open it up. The new file is called payroll in, and when I open it up, we can see that all eight records were written to this file. And we can also see that Joe Smith earned $630. Peggy Fisher, the next record, earned $507.50 for this week. So this has been an example of reading in a line sequential file and generating another line sequential file that will be input to another program. Welcome to the next challenge. In this challenge, you will read a file containing a list of employees and their respective hourly rate. The idea is that all employees are getting a 3% cost of living increase. 
so you will need to read each record, calculate the new hourly rate, and write a new record to a new employee file. You will start with the employee raised at CBL. If you prefer, you can always start from scratch, but this is a good starting point. For input, you can use mfile.dat as your input. As I stated, you're going to give all employees a 3% cost of living raise. To provide data integrity of the input file, we want to write a new line sequential file called new mfile.dat. I've also purposely left off the logic to check for a valid file status, so make sure you add that as well. All the sample files are located in your Exercise Files folder under Chapter 4 under 0406. When you're ready, give it a try. When you're done, feel free to compare your version of the solution to mine. How did you make out with the challenge? Well, I hope you had fun and I hope you were able to successfully update the program. I'd like to walk through my solution, which probably will look very close to yours. All right, the first thing you probably noticed was that when you add on line 8 the file status is file check key and run the program, I did in the original program have a typo where I had mfile2. So you might have gotten that file not found error. So that's when you want to go back and look and take out the 2. And now if you ran it again, it should be good. The file status check is actually really good for any time you open any file. All right, let's scroll down a little bit. So here we have the employee details of the files that are coming in, and we're basically going to write an exact duplicate, except for the fact that we want to update the hourly rate. The first thing we see here in the file section is the file layout for the incoming file. As you can see, it includes all the employee information, including hours worked. You might notice that I actually rearranged a few things, because I want the output file to be almost exactly as the input file, except for the field hours worked. So what I did on line 19 is I created a group object called mpinfo, and it redefines mpdata, which is 38 characters. So that allows me to just move those 38 characters from the input file directly to the output file without having to worry about moving each piece of data, such as employee ID, employee, last name, first name. So you'll see that I can just say employee data, move that to new employee data. All right. But we do need to access the hourly rate, and now we can. In the second file description for the new employee file, the only data that I need is the first 38 characters from the original file, plus the new hourly rate, plus the department and the gender. OK, now we're into working storage. Remember, when you have a value such as a salary increase, which in this case was 3%, it's nice to just put it in one place as a literal in working storage. That way, if next year they get a higher increase or a lower increase, all I have to do is change it in this one spot. So right now I have WS increase on line 46 set to 1.03. And that'll give my hourly employees a 3% increase in their hourly rate. All right, if we scroll down a little further, notice that I left this blank so that you could actually add your logic to check for the file status. So if file check key, is not equal to 00, zero then we know that something's wrong so then we can display a message that says error reading file status code and add the status code so we'll add the file check key now one thing i do want to point out too and i don't think i pointed this out in the other videos see where my cursor is flashing after the y well, if you look down in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see it says line 55, column 75. And what do we know about that? We know that we're too far over to the right because COBOL programs can't go past line 72. So I'm just going to move that whole thing down to the next line. All right, so if that happens and they do display the error, the next thing that I want to happen is I want to go to the end program because if the input file is corrupt or not found, I can't actually process any records. So I want to do perform 9000 end program. And now I just want to do an end if to make sure that I stop the check for checking the file status. All right, then you read in the records. And if I scroll down a little further, here's where I have the code to calculate the hourly rate. So I move the employee info to the new employee data, and that moves the first 38 characters. Then I compute the new hourly rate by taking the existing hourly rate times 1.03.
and I move the resulting value to the new hourly rate. I move the department and the gender, and then I write the new employee record after advancing one line. I add one to the count, and then I read the next employee record. All right, let's go ahead and save this, Control S, and over on the right, I'm gonna go ahead and compile it. So I'm gonna do COBC dash X, and I called this solution.cbl. All right, so that looks like it went well. Let's go ahead and run it. So dot slash solution. It says it processed eight records. So let's go ahead and take a look. If I scroll up a little bit, we can see we should have a new emp file.dat that has the new hourly rates. So let's open that up. So it is called new emp file. It looks like Joe Smith is making $16.22 an hour. So it looks like the 3% increase was processed correctly. If I open up the original file, we can see that it is not changed, so we still have the original employee file, and you can see where Joe was making $15.75. Okay, so that's my solution to the problem. Like I said, I hope you had fun with this activity. Often COBOL programs manage information about employees by storing their data in large sequential files. Then daily or weekly transaction files are created which contain the changes required to update these records. For example, the transaction file might contain new additions, changes, or even deletions of the main employee records. Let's take a look at a flowchart depicting this activity. We have a program called Process Employee. The Process Employee takes in a master employee file. It also takes in the weekly transaction file. It produces a new master employee file along with any errors that might have occurred, specifically if you're adding new employees, any duplicates that you might find. Now the question is, how do I insert these new records? The problem is, on the left, I have my transaction file, and I want to actually insert them into my master file, but we can't insert into a sequential file. So even the first record, 001, cannot be put into in front of 003 in the master file. So instead, my program takes in the master file, and then it also takes in the transaction file that needs to add to the master file. And what it does is it merges those two into a new file and becomes the new master file. And then that file will then again come back in as the master file the next time we have to process transactions. Let's take a look at how we do this with our COBOL program. For this program, we need four files. We need two files that will be input. On line seven, I have select employee file assigned to employeefile.dat. That is my master employee file. On line 11, I have select transaction file, trans file, and assign it to emptrans.dat. And then on line 15, I start my output files, which is a new employee file called new file.dat. And line 18, it's a second output file that is my error report. Okay, let's scroll down a little bit. In the data division, we don't really care too much about the details of the file except for the employee ID. So notice on line 25, where I have my group record for the employee details, I do have on line 26, a 88 level employee end of file indicator, which is set to high values. And line 27 is the employee ID, which is the first seven characters of the file, followed by filler for the rest. On line 30, we define the transaction file the same way. So this transaction file is just gonna contain any new employees that I wanna add to my master file. I have another 88 level on line 32, trans EOF, which starts with high values. I do need to identify the employee ID, but then the rest of the record is defined as filler. On line 36 is the third file, which will be my new master file. So it's called new emp file, and it just contains one record that has a pick X of 75, because I don't need to separate out the employee ID from the rest of the record. And the last file on line 39, the output file, is just a print line, which has a filler of 132 characters. All right, let's scroll down a little bit more. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in the working storage section. You can go back and take a look at that when you get a chance. Let's go down to the procedure division to see how the program works. First, we open up our input file. We check to make sure that the open was successful. Then we open up the transaction file that we're going to use. We check to make sure that was successful. If everything looks good, we open up our output file. 
and we open up the new file, new employee file, so that we can write to that file. Let's scroll down a little more. The next paragraph is where we actually read the employees. So line 92 reads the employee file and at end sets the end of file indicator to true. We read the, the first record in the trans file and same thing at end we set the trans end of file indicator to true. Then we perform the process employees. Notice the syntax here is a little different than what we've seen before. In this case, I'm telling the program to perform process employees until both the employee end of file indicator is true and the transaction end of file indicator is true. And then I end the program. Okay, scroll down again. Also in process employees, I am using another new verb in COBOL called the evaluate verb. It's similar to a switch. It says evaluate true. So when line 109 checks to see if the employee ID is less than the new employee ID, if that's true, then it executes the code below. So the evaluate has a corresponding when. So I evaluate when if the employee ID on the master file is less than the employee ID on the transaction file, then I just want to go ahead and write the employee details out to my new record. So I go ahead and do that. Now, line 115 says, well, wait a minute, when the employee ID is greater than the new employee ID, that means that I need to insert this employee prior to writing out the existing master record. So here, I'm going to write the new employee record from the employee transaction file and read the next record on the transaction file. And finally, on line 121 is my last evaluate statement where I check to see if the employee ID of the master file is equal to the employee ID in the transaction file. If it is, I move it to a detail line so that I can print out an error message saying that was a duplicate. Okay, and in our end program, we close all our files and stop run. Let's take a look at the results from running this program. So first, let's look at the input. The input for this run was an employee file, which started with Joe Smith and his employee ID record was 100, and ends with Sherry Slattery, whose ID record was 800. The new employees that I wanted to add to this file start after Joe with record 110, record ID 110, Zara Khalil, and ends with Natisha McClay, who is supposed to have an ID number of 800, but we know that's going to be a duplicate. So let's take a look at the new employee file first. So here's the new employee file.dat. You can see that the very first record is still Joe Smith, but then Zara Khalil got inserted between Joe Smith and Taylor Brown. And the record with the employee ID 800 is still Sherry Slattery. That's because if we look at our report, which I'll open up next, we will see that there's an error report saying that the record on the transaction file that had an employee ID of 800 was a duplicate. This type of program logic is really common in many existing mainframe COBOL applications. The new file is then renamed as input for the next day and the next set of new employee records. In addition to inserting new records into a master file, it is common to have a transaction file that contains changes and maybe even some deletions. For example, let's say it's an employee master file. Employees could change their name or employees might even leave the company. So you might have to update an existing employee record and you might have to remove a record. The process flow is that we start with our update employee program, which takes as input the master employee file and the employee transaction file. It is important to note that both the master file and the transaction file must be sorted by the employee ID prior to coming into this program. If you're not familiar how to sort a file, check out my video on sorting. Every record from the master employee file is read in and checked against the transaction file for changes or even deletions. If none exists, it is written directly to the new master file as output. The transaction file for this program has a new field added to the end to indicate whether it's a change or a delete. If the transaction code is a C, indicating that there's a change to the record, the master record will be updated with the transaction record information. If it is a D, then we simply ignore the record from both files, and neither one is written to the new master employee file. That way is removed from the file. Okay. Let's switch back over to Visual Studio and take a look at both the master employee file, the transaction file, and the program. Let's start by looking at the employee master file. 
For my program, it's called empmaster.dat, and we can see it has 13 records. Now, let's look at the transaction file. The transaction file only has six records, and if I scroll all the way to the right, we'll see that there is now an extra field with either a C for a change or a D for delete. What do you notice about this file? Lines 3 and 6 appear to be missing information, but that's because lines 3 and 6 are records that I want to delete, so I don't need the employee information if I'm just going to delete the record. Okay, let's start with the environment division. Here on line 7, we're selecting our employee file, and on line 11, the trans file. On line 15 is where we're creating our new employee file. All right, let's scroll down to the data division. We have the employee file as well as the trans file. Now notice in the trans file on line 32, there is a new piece of information and it's a trans code and it has only one character. Okay, let's scroll down to our procedure division next. Here, we open our input file and we check to make sure the open was successful. We open the trans file as input as well and we check to see if that was successful. And then finally, we open up our output file, which is the new employee master file. Let's scroll down a little bit. We read the employee file and the transaction file. And then on line 82, we perform paragraph 200 process employees until both the employee end of file indicator and the transaction end of file indicator are both true. Then we know we're done. On line 89, and scroll down again, is the start of the process employees. Here, we evaluate, starting on line 91, when the employee ID, which is the ID that's on the master file, is less than the employee ID on the transaction file, then I know there's no changes or deletions to this record, and I can just write it to the output file. If the employee ID is greater than the new employee ID, then I need to take the employee record from the transaction file and write that to the new master file and read the next transaction file record. Let me scroll down again. And the last two conditions are when the employee ID from the master file matches the employee ID from the transaction file. Then I need to check and see what the trans code is. We know if it's a D, we want to delete. So if that's the case, we just read the next file from the transaction file and the employee file skipping over that record. If it's a C for change, well, then we need to take the change information from the transaction file and move it over to the new master file. So we do that, and then we write the new record on line 115. Then we read another transaction file record and another employee file record. Okay, let's go ahead and run the program. Okay, it looks like it ran, so let's take a look at the new employee file. There we go, and we can see that some of the records have been changed as well as I went from 13 records in my original master file down to 11 because two of the transaction records had D for delete. In this situation, which again is a typical situation for COBOL, after the program has run, the new master file would then be renamed to be the incoming master file for the next day's transactions. Editors, um, I'm going to add another little section, but if the video is too long, we can cut it. One thing that you might be thinking about is what happens if the employee trans code is actually invalid. Let's say someone typed in an E instead of a D for delete. Well, I can tell you from experience what would happen is I'd be in an infinite loop. Because if we scroll down to our procedure division to where we process the employees, if it's not one of these four conditions, it never moves on to the next record. So it kind of gets stuck in place. So what we can do is we can add some logic, and it's probably a good idea, to check and make sure that the, if the employee IDs are equal, that there is a valid trans code. So let's add that final statement here. And we're going to say when the trans code is not equal to a C or a D. What's nice about COBOL, which I can't say the same about some of the newer languages, is that I don't have to repeat the entire thing. I can use this shortened version. If this was Java, I'd have to say when transcode is not equal to C or when transcode is not equal to D. And if that's the case, then I want to display an error message. So I'm going to say invalid transaction code for the employee ID, comma, and I want to print out the employee ID. I'm going to put this on the next line, though, because I'm getting too far over to the right. And then I'm going to read the next transaction file record. So I want to do read transfile. And at end, set 
trans end of file to true. And I'm going to end the read. Okay, so if we get through all the four conditions above, and the only problem is at this point the transaction code was not equal to a C or a D on the transaction file, I'm just going to go ahead and skip over that transaction file record. Let's go ahead and save this. I'm going to save it as just update employee without the start. That way you'll have the original start if you want to try it. And I'm going to click OK and OK again. Now I need to compile it. So let me do cobc-x. And I'm going to compile update employee.cbl. OK, the compile worked. Now before I run it, Notice the employee trans has this big circle here. That means that a change was made and it's not been saved yet. So I do need to save this. I'm going to do Control S and now it's gone. Otherwise, it would just have the original file. All right, and let's try it. So employee, and we get the message that uh, the employee ID 325 had an invalid, so if we look at that, had an invalid value. So this is employee 325. And now if we look at the new master file, Notice employee 325 is not deleted, it's still there. So that's important too. You don't want to lose the record that came in just because the transaction code was invalid. Considering that COBOL is used extensively for writing reports, you can imagine that many of the reports require the data to be sorted. There are two types of sorting in COBOL. We have an external sort and an internal sort. The external sort is completed using the JCL. For this movie, we will concentrate on the internal sort which uses the powerful sort verb that can sort large amounts of data in the program. The data coming in can be sorted by a single field or even by combining multiple fields to make a more complex key structure. Let's take a look at the flow of the sort. So if we wanted to sort records in a master file, we have our sorting students.cbl, we have our program, which takes in the master student file that is unsorted. It creates a temporary work file that temporary work file is key. It is used to hold records while the sort process is in progress. And then finally, we have our output file, which is the new file containing all the students in sorted order based on the key. All right, let's switch over to Visual Studio and take a look at an example. Let's start by taking a look at the data file for the students coming into the program. So the data file is just called students.dat, which has a student number, but that's not in any sorted order, as well as the name. I do want to point out towards the end of the record, see the fourth from the end it starts with an ENG for Tom Powers. That is actually representing the student's major, followed by the gender. So Tom is an engineering major, whereas Dana is a business major. I think we'll sort by major for the first time in the program. Let's switch over to the code. And we'll take a quick look at how we have everything set up in the environment division. We need to identify our incoming file, which is normal. On line 7, select student file and assign it to students.dat. On line 11 is our output file. It's just called sorted file, and we assign it to new students.dat. And line 14 is where we actually define that work file that I was talking about. So we have select work file and assign it to work.tmp. It's important to note that the space for that file will be released when the program's done. It does not save that file. Let's scroll down a little bit, because I do want to point out in the data division, we have our file description for the input file on line 18. That's normal. And on line 21, we have the file description for the output file. But notice on line 25, the work file is actually defined with an SD instead of an FD. Also, the definition for the work file, which starts with a group item 01 work record, actually contains both filler and some names. The names identify the fields that I might want to use for my sorting. So right now I'm not using the student ID, which would have been the first seven characters of the file. But I am using the major and maybe later on the last name and first name. Okay, let's scroll down to the procedure division. And as you can see, right now it's not a whole lot to it. We open the input file. We sort the work file on ascending key using the major, using the student file, which is the input, and giving the sorted file. Then when we're all done, we close the student file. All right, let's go ahead and compile it. Okay, everything seemed to compile. Let's go ahead and run it. All right, let's take a look at our new student file. So it should have written out a new student file. New students. 
and we can see that now they're sorted by their major. The very first one, Danielle, is a bio major, followed by Dana, who is business. Okay, that's great, but that really is probably not the end of our sorting. Chances are, if we're going to sort by major, we probably want to sort by the student's last name and first name within major. So let's go back over to our sorting students program and let's add that as well. So here, where I have sort on work file on ascending key W major, I'm just going to add that I also want to sort on WS student, student last name, followed by W student F name. And I still want to use the incoming student file, and I still want to produce a sorted file. Okay, let's go ahead and save this. I'm going to do Control S. I do want to point out real quick that if you look at the tab that has the sorting students underscore start.cbl, notice there's a circle there. That circle means that I have not saved this file yet. So let me go ahead and do Control S, and the circle goes away. Now in the terminal window, I am just going to go ahead and get the sort statement back again and I'm going to go ahead and sort it, and now I'm going to run it, and now we can take a look at our new students, which will automatically be updated, and we can see that already some things are different. It looks like Dana got moved down because Trevor Hubert, actually H comes before K alphabetically. So now my records are sorted by major, and then by last name, and then by first name, in case two students have the same last name. In the sorting movie, we learned how to write code to sort a single input file. But what if we want to combine and sort multiple files? Well, we're in luck, since COBOL has a way to sort multiple incoming files and create one or more output files that are combined and in sorted order. This companion statement is the merge verb. It can combine the contents of multiple files together as long as the files are the same length and as long as the files all need to be sorted in a similar manner according to the same key structure. The resulting output will consist of the contents of all the input files merged together and sorted according to that key structure. Let's take a look at the flow. So once again we have our program in the middle, in this case merging students.cbl, and for input we have student file 1 and student file 2. We have a temporary work file because we still need to merge and sort inside the program. And then you can see that for output, we'll be creating a new combined student file that will be in sorted order. Let's take a look at the program. I'm going to switch over to Visual Studio. In your Exercise Files folder, under Chapter 5, you can find the, the program MergeStudents.cbl. This program, as you can see on lines 7 and 11, is going to read in two files, a student file and a new student file. Let's take a look at those to see what kind of data is coming in. So students.dat is just a list of students not sorted in any particular order, and we can see that there is 32 students. The new students, maybe they transferred in from a different district, contains six students. Again, they're not sorted by student ID or name, but we just have these six students. What we want to do is we want to merge these two together, and this time I'm going to sort by their student ID. So in our Merge Students program, you'll notice that we still have to declare a work file. So line 18 is identifying the name of the work file that was temporary and only used during the execution of the program, just like we did when we were using the sort verb. All right, let's scroll down a little bit. I just want to take a quick glance at the work file starting on line 31 because here I actually on line 33 gave the student ID a name so that I could use that field to sort by. So I'm going to sort by student ID when I merge the two files and produce the output. So we'll scroll down a little bit. So we can see starting with paragraph 50 which is our start paragraph the first thing we do is perform 100 read students. In the read students paragraph which is on line 56 we open the two input files the student file and the new student file. So on line 60, we see the new verb merge. We're going to use the temporary work file and we're going to merge on ascending key. And as I stated on line 61, I'm going to use the key W student ID. Line 62, we identify the two files that we're bringing in. So we're using student file and new student file. And then the output on line 64, giving sorted file. 
We go back up after that's done to line 53, which says perform 9000 end program, where we close the files, stop run, and end the program. Okay, let me save this. I'm going to do Control S, and over on the right, I'm going to compile it. Now that the compile was successful, I can run the program. And now let's take a look at the new file that got created. It's called students.new, and we can see how many records there are. So we'll scroll down, and there's 38. There was 32 on the students.dat and 6 in the new students.dat. And you notice right away that they're sorted by the ID number at the very start of the file. We could actually change that and sort by last name. We can sort by major very easily. Let's go back to Merge Students. And right here where we have W Student ID, we can just change that. So we're going to sort on the W Student last name and the W Student first name. I'm going to save this. I'm going to compile it. I'm going to run it. And now when we look at our students.new, we should see that all the names are sorted by the last name and followed by the first name. So it looks like everything worked. The output of a merge may be written automatically to one or more output files or may be processed internally by the program. The next challenge involves reading into employee files. It seems that Acme Dynamite Company just purchased Fuses Incorporated. So your job is to write a program that can merge the two employee files and provide a third that has all the employees in sorted order. I suggest that you might want to take a look at the merge students.cbl that we used earlier to merge two student files. The two input files for this program are the acme.dat and fusesincorporated.dat. It's important to note that both files have already been reformatted by the company, so they have the same length and field sizes. Make sure that you add logic to check for a valid file status, and your job is to update the program to merge the two employee files. When you're done, you'll create an output file with all the employees sorted by Social Security number. For an additional challenge, try closing the output file when you're done and reopen it to print out all the employees to a report. When you're done, if you want, take a look at my solution to see how I approach this problem. Have fun! How did you make out with the challenge? So in this one, you had to set it up so it could read two employee files, the Acme employees and the Fuses Incorporated employees, merge them together, and then I recommended for a little bit more of a challenge to write a report. So let's take a look at my code. And actually, I kind of backed it up a little bit because I had a problem with this code. And it's something that I've run into several times. So I wanted to show it to you because I think it might be something that's good to know. So here I have in my environment division, I am creating my input file for Acme employees on line 7. And on line 11, we have the Fuses Incorporated employees coming in as an input file. Let me scroll down a little bit. Since we're going to merge and sort the employee files, on line 15, I have the name of the file that I'll be writing to. And on line 18 is the name of the report that I'm going to produce. And on line 21 is the temporary file that I'll use for my merge sort. All right, next is the data division. Of course, we have the file definition for the Acme employee, for the Fuses employees. And now we have the sorted file. And don't forget, if you want to sort on something different than the fields that I have identified here, you have to make sure you identify them. For example, right now I can sort by Social Security number, last name, or first name. But another piece of data that exists in the file is the start date. So if I wanted to sort by start date, I'd have to add that here to the sort details. All right, next we have our work file. And don't forget your work file, which is a temporary file, gets defined as an S, as in Sam, D. SD on line 41. Then on line 48, I had to add another file description for my report file. And we'll scroll down a little bit more. And on line 60 is the report detail. So I kept it very simple. All I'm going to do for my report is print out the Social Security number, the last name, and the first name with some spaces between each. All right, let's take a look at the procedure division. The first thing I do in the Read Employees paragraph is to open for input the two files, the Acme employees and the Fuses Incorporated employees. I check their file status. If everything's good, 
on line 83, I go ahead and merge using that work file on ascending key based on the social security number. I merge the Acme employees and the Fuses employees. And it says giving, which is where my output file will be, giving the sorted file. Let me scroll down. And then what I wanted to do, that would be fine and it would work, but I wanted to be able to print a report. So what I did now is that after line 87, the sorted file is, it was never open, but actually it was written to. So that's where all our new records are. So in order to process it, I have to open it again so that I can access the very first record. Otherwise, I'll already be at the last record. So on line 89, I open the input sorted file. Line 91, I open the output for my report file. And then as usual, I read the very first record, just so we at least get the first record read. Then I go ahead and perform 200, print employees through 200 end until the sort is at end of file, sort EOF. All right, let's scroll down to 200. And then in 200, I took some time to move my data fields from the sort file to the working storage detail line. And on line 106, I write the report detail from the WS report detail after advancing one line. All right, let me go ahead and save this. So I'm gonna do Control S. And over here on the right, I'm gonna compile it. And it's just called solution.cbl, located in your exercise files folder in chapter five. All right, everything worked, and now I'm gonna run it. Hmm, it's taking a little longer than usual. As you might have noticed, all of these programs, because they're such small input files, they run fairly quickly. So at this point, I think it's fair to say that I have some kind of infinite loop going on. Now, the problem with the Visual Studio, the best way that I found to get out of a situation like this is just to close it all together. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Now I'm gonna open up my Debian and you can see that my Debian Linux environment, I've done this a few times, I'm gonna type in code space dot to relaunch Visual Studio. And what's really nice is it opens all my files back up to where they were when I abruptly closed the window. All right, so I know that I have some type of infinite loop. I know that something's wrong. And like I said, this can happen. And so I just wanted to show it to you because sometimes if you are running a program and you notice that it's not ending, you know, it's probably some problem with the way you have the code structure. So I suggest that you maybe close Visual Studio and reopen it and then take a closer look at your code. Okay, let's look at our code. So what happened was in our procedure division, everything looks good, right? There's no errors. We open up our input files. We then go ahead and read the first record on line 92. We're reading the first record from the sorted file. And then we go down to line 95 where we print them. The problem is in my print employees, I have nothing to read the next record. So what's happening is it's just performing print employees over and over and over again. Because if I don't ever read another record from my sorted file, the sorted end of file indicator is never reset. Okay, so let me copy this so that I can paste it down into my 0200 paragraph. So after I write out the employee, I can read in the next one. And this time, don't forget to save it first before you compile it. So I'm going to do Control S. And now over in the right in the terminal window, I'm going to compile it again. And I'm gonna try and run it again. And you can see how quick it was. So this time it came right back and it's very evident that definitely something was wrong last time. All right, so let's take a look at our report.lpt. All right, good. You can see that all the employees are in one file now. And you can also see that they are sorted by their social security numbers. So it looks like the solution is correct. And again, I just wanted to show you what to do if you think you might be in an infinite loop. So far, all of our programs have been written using sequential files. When our program needs to process all the records in a file, this is our best choice. But the main drawback is when you have to insert, delete, amend, or even update a record because a whole new file must be created. This makes sequential files not efficient when access is needed to only a few records. For example, if 10 records are to be inserted into a 10,000 record file, then all 10,000 records will have to be read from the old file and 10,010 records will be have to be written to the new file. This really increases the time to insert a new record. 
But lucky for us, COBOL has something called direct access files. There are two types of direct access files. They include relative and indexed. When working with relative access files, we use relative records, which are organized by ascending relative record number. For the index files, we use index records that are stored based on an ascending primary key. Both relative and index files can be read sequentially or as direct access. Direct access means we can directly go to a certain record in the file. Let's take a closer look at indexed file organization. Index files can have multiple alphanumeric keys, but they must have at least one primary key. The position of the key has to be the same for each record in the file. The index provides a logical ordering of the records. It's important to note that this might not represent the physical ordering of the records in the file. The access modes allowed with index files are sequential, random, or dynamic. Reading sequentially is actually based on the index key values. Now let's talk about relative files. Records stored in a relative file organization are stored based on their location relative to the beginning of the file, hence the name the relative file organization. The first record has a relative record number of 1. The access modes are similar to that of the indexed file. We have sequential, random, and dynamic. And sequential access is also allowed with the relative file, and it would use the relative record number. Knowing that we now have sequential, indexed, and relative file organizations, it might be difficult to figure out which one to use. I have a table that might help. In this table, I'm comparing sequential access, indexed, and relative. If we look at sequential, we see that data is entered in sequential order. Duplicate data is allowed because there are no keys when you're dealing with a sequential access file. Data does not have to be sorted. We cannot delete directly from a sequential file. Actually, we can't insert or update either. Access in a sequential file can be slow, but a benefit is that the data can be stored either on tape or on disk. Now indexed, data is entered in key sequential order, but duplicate data, or at least duplicate keys, are not allowed. Data is sorted based on the key value. Deletes are allowed, which makes it fast. Access is faster and data is stored on disk only. And finally, relative, data is entered in relative record number order. Duplicate data or duplicate relative record numbers are not allowed, and data is sorted based on the relative record number, or RRN. Deleting of records is allowed, and access is even faster than indexed. And again, like the indexed file organization, data is stored only on disk. I think you'll find that most files in existing COBOL programs are going to use the sequential file organization and the sequential access, but it is important to know that you can use both indexed and relative. To access records that are stored in a relative file, a relative record number, or RRN, must be provided. Supplying this number allows the record to be accessed directly, which saves time because the system can use the start position of the file on disk and the size of the record and the relative record number to calculate the position of the record. Here's an image showing a disk, and on that disk we have our file. We use the relative record number, in this case 4, times the record length to get the offset for finding my record. It takes us directly to the record that we want. In order to demonstrate reading relative files, first we need to create one. Since it cannot be done using a regular text editor, I've written a small COBOL program that will read in a sequential file and save it as a relative file. Let's take a look. I'm going to switch over to Visual Studio. In your Exercise Files folder under Chapter 6, we start with RelativeRecords.cbl. This is going to read in a small file called studios.seq.dat, which is a line sequential file that I created with some dummy data. We can take a look here. You can see there's um, a two-digit code, the name of the studio, and an address. The plan is to take that input file and to create a relative record file. So on line 11, I have select studios file and assign it to studios rel for relative. I added a file status is file check key on line 12. And on line 13 is where I tell it that the organization of this new file is relative. And on line 15, I say relative key is studios key. 
When creating a relative record file, it's important you have to specify the relative key. Now, I do want to point out that the relative key, it cannot be part of any file description. It's actually in working storage. So let me scroll down and we'll see in working storage here on line 40, we have the studios key, which must be defined as numeric. Okay, I'll scroll down a little further. And you can see I'm opening for input, the input studios, opening for output, the, the new studios file. We read the input file and then we go down to process file. Let me scroll down there. There we move the record that was coming in from the input file to the output file and we write the record. I did add on line 63 a new statement called invalid key. Because we're using the relative record number as the key, if for some reason there was a duplicate, we want to make sure we display an error message. So invalid key will display the studio status and it'll print out the file check key along with the studio code so we know which one caused the problem. We read the next record and we continue until we've created our relative records file. All right, over on the right, I'm gonna go ahead and run this. And as usual, it doesn't really print anything out because it's just creating a file that contains relative records. Okay, so now we wanna make sure that everything was written correctly. So there's a second program in your exercise file folder called read relative. And this actually will allow us to read the input file and I've added two options. You can either print out the entire file by reading all the records sequentially, or you can provide a relative record number and only see that record. Let's take a quick look at the code. On line eight is where I have my input file, which is the file that we just created, the studios REL for the relative record file. And it's important to note, we have to say that this is organization is relative. So on line 10 is where I identify that. Line 11, this time, since I actually want to be able to access randomly any record, I have access mode is random rather than sequential. And then finally, again, we need to specify the relative key. So the relative key here is RRN Studios key. And notice, once again, it cannot be part of any file description. It has to be in working storage. So I'll scroll down and there it is on line 33. I'll show you the code real quick. So in the start paragraph, I'm just displaying two messages that say, do you want to do a direct read or a sequential read? Depending on which one you choose, if you chose direct read, it'll ask you for a relative record number. On line 57, I'm reading in that relative record number. Then I'm reading the input studios. And because I have a relative record number in the RRN studios key, it will use that to do a direct read to that record. Okay, I've already compiled this, so I'm gonna go ahead and run this. So dot slash read relative this time. I'm gonna move the terminal window over a little bit so you can see a little bit more because it just prints to the screen here. All right, let's do a direct read first. So I'll do the number two and hit enter. And we can see it read all the records irregardless of the numbers that we have for the codes because it's reading them based on relative record number. Just so happens that these are in numeric order, but even if they weren't, it would still print them out in relative record number order. All right, let's run it again. And this time I'll show you how easy it is to do a direct read. So I'll type in the number one to do a direct read. And let's see, I'll pick, we know there's 11 records. I'll read the last one. So I'll say, give me whatever record is at the relative record number 11. Notice there is an 11 for PNC movies, but when I do this, I get real time videos because that was at relative record 11. All right, one more time and we'll just do another direct read and let's just do the first one. And this time it gave me the relative record that was at position one, which was Fisher Studio. So you can see how nice it is if you know what the relative record number is to do a direct read. This is one of the benefits of using a relative file organization. Index files are very flexible and powerful. Index files may have up to 255 keys. Only the primary key must be unique, and index files can be read sequentially by any of its keys. To demonstrate the power of index files, we need to start with the sequential file and create an initial index file. Let me switch over to Visual Studio and we'll take a look. For my example, I have a small sequential file that contains 29 records. They're just movies that I like to watch. Notice that the input file starts with a five digit numeric movie code 
followed by 40 characters of a movie name, followed by a two-digit supplier code. So I can add index fields based on any of those three different fields. Remember, an index file can have multiple keys. So for this example, I'm going to use the video code as the primary key. Let me go over to my COBOL program. And the movie title as an alternate or secondary key. The information that specifies the keys is located when you create the indexed file. So in this example, on line 8, I have the movie file that's coming in. But then on line 11 is where I specify the index file that I'm going to create. On line 12, I have the file status. On line 13, I have organization is indexed. Line 14 has the access mode is random. Line 15 says that the record key is the movie code index. And we'll take a look at that in a second. Line 16 is the alternate key. The alternate key for this is the movie title. And it does allow for duplicates. Let me scroll down a little bit. Remember the relative file? We weren't allowed to include the relative record number in the file description. Well, for the index files, it's the opposite. We have to include the field that represents the key. So notice in the data division, starting on line 19, the record description, starting on line 22, where I have movie record IDX for index. I, on line 23, I have the movie code index, which is made up of the first five numeric characters. Line 24, I have the movie title as 40 characters. And finally, line 25, I have the supplier code as two more digits at the very end of the file. The movie file sequential is the definition of the file that's coming into the program. For index files, behind the scenes, the computer is going to build an index that helps to traverse the actual data records. So when direct access is required, the file system uses the index to find, read, insert, update, or delete the required record. When you specify an alternate key in the index file, an alternate index is also built. Once the index file is built, we'll run a second program that will allow us to retrieve records based on an index value. So we'll scroll down just to take a quick look at the procedure division. But as you can see, we simply, on line 46, open the input file, and line 47, the output file. We read the priming record on line 49, and then we process the file until end of file. So paragraph 200, process file, reads all the records in from the sequential file and creates a new file that contains the indexes that we have specified in the select statement. Okay, let's go ahead and run this program. First, I'll compile it. Okay, now we'll run it. So this is going to create our index file. Oops, I forgot my slash. So let's try it again. Dot slash create index file. All right, it looks like everything was good. Now let's take a look at an example of a program that reads an indexed file. In this program, read index file, which is also located in your exercise files folder, we have on line nine, the incoming file, which is our indexed file. Select movie file. Notice the organization is indexed on line 11. The access mode is dynamic. On line 13, we have the record key is movie code, but we have an alternate record key of movie title that allows for duplicates. So when I run this program, I can use the movie code to go directly to a record, or I can use the movie title. I will scroll down a little further. And for this program, what I did in the procedure division is I simply print out two statements that say, do you want to select the record by video code or by title? So lines 49 and 50 display the message. Line 52 reads in the user's answer. And based on the answer, we ask them to enter in the video code or the video title. And then we try and find that record based on the index. All right, let's go ahead and run this so we can see how this works. So I'm going to do read index file. Oops, again, I forgot my slash. So read index file. And we can say we want to find a record based on movie. Let's do movie title. And we'll type in the mummy. And we got not found. So let's take a look at our input file. And let's try this again. So I'm going to run it again. And this time I'm going to do title again. But this time I'm going to use all capital letters. The mummy. There we go. So it is case sensitive. And that's something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, let's run it again, and this time we'll try and search by video code. So I'll do one, and let's pick 
10001, which is the movie called Red. Well, you can see how quick it is. It very quickly uses the index to find the record that I've chosen. So for my examples, I am choosing the movies based on either the video code or the title. But remember, index files can be read sequentially, or they can be read using the direct access method of using the index keys. Welcome to the next challenge. This challenge involves creating an indexed file and then writing a program to be able to read from the indexed file. Providing direct access can really speed up a search. When your program requires the ability to select certain records from a file using data from the file, an indexed file is a really good choice. We start by converting a line sequential file to an indexed file. I have provided a file in your exercise files folder under chapter 6 that contains some information from a few Major League Baseball games from 2016. Each file contains a record that has an ID, the date of the game, the attendance, the venue for the game, the home and away team names, the runs respectively, and the number of innings that were played. The goal is to use this file and create an indexed file. The ID is unique in the file, so use the ID as the primary key, and then based on the other information, you can choose one or more secondary keys. Remember, with indexed files, the secondary keys do not have to be unique. You can have duplicates. But you want to think about how will an end user want to find data in this file. Considering it's Major League Baseball, they might want a file based on the date of the game, or maybe who was the home team. So those might be good options for secondary keys. I'm suggesting to write a second program that will actually be the one that will read the indexed file that you created. The second program will allow the user to enter a key and it'll print out the respective records. For this challenge, I've used Google's BigQuery and the public data samples that are available to generate a common delimited file, which has records, as I stated, from the MLB games from 2016. Let's switch to Excel so we can see the results of the query. As you can see, I was able to open the common delimited file in Excel, and it contains a game ID, followed by a year, the start time, attendance, away team name, home team name, the venue, state, and some other information. I took the common delimited file and used another program to convert the common delimited file to a line sequential file. I address this logic later on in the unstring chapter. From there, I eliminated the duplicates so I would only have a unique game ID for each record. Let me show you the record layout for the final version of the baseball file that's available in the exercise files folder. The file that I created has a total of 127 characters. The first 36 represent the game ID, followed by the year, followed by the date of the game, which is in year, month, day format, followed by the time, the start time of the game, then the attendance, then the name of the home team, the name of the away team, and then there is some additional information that you can look at. So write your program to read in the line sequential file to create the indexed file, and then from there, write a second program that will read the index file by using some type of key to find certain records in the file and then print them out. When you're done, feel free to come back and take a look at my solution so you can see how I address this problem. How did you make out with the challenge? I'd like to show you how I approach this problem. Here I just have a copy of the baseball file that's coming into the program. As you can see, the game ID, which is the first 36 characters, is unique for each game. Let me switch over to the create index file. In this program, I need to bring in that line sequential file and write out a new indexed file. So starting with the environment division, on line 8 we see where I'm reading in the line sequential file that we just looked at. Scroll down a little bit. Line 11 is where I define the baseball index file. And notice on line 13, it says organization is indexed. Line 14 says access mode is random. Line 15 is where I define my record key. As I stated, I made sure that the game ID did not have any duplicates. I removed all the duplicates. So I can make the record key the game ID key, which I called code IDX. I decided that it might be helpful to be able to pull up all the games that happened on a certain date, 
or maybe I want to look up games for the home team. So I added two alternative record keys. On line 16 is my first one, where I have alternate record key is the date, and it does allow duplicates because more than one baseball game can happen on the same day. Line 18 is where I have the home team as my index, and again, it allows duplicates because each team plays more than once. All right, let's scroll down a little bit. We can see that the first file definition on line 23 is the new baseball file, which contains the indexes. And on line 33 is the incoming file, which is the line sequential file. And here I've defined each of the fields so you can see what data is included in the record. Let me scroll down a little bit more. This particular program is pretty short because we're just going to take the sequential file and write it back out to the index file. So in the procedure division, which starts on line 69, I have read baseball games. I open for input the sequential file and I open for output the index file. Line 75, I read the first sequential record and then I perform 200 process file until end of file on line 78. So if we scroll down, we can see that we're writing the baseball record index from the baseball record sequential. If we happen to have an invalid key, we can display an error message. Then we end the write statement, and then we read the next record in the sequential file until we reach end of file. And that's pretty much it. So for this one, that's all we have to do. Now let's look at reading the index file. This is a lot more exciting. So in the read index file program, I start on line eight by selecting my file name, baseball, and I assign it to the new index file that I created. On line 10, I specify that the organization is indexed. On line 11, I say the access mode is dynamic. Line 12, I define the record key again as being the game ID or the code ID. On line 13 is where I make sure I define that alternate record key. And on line 15, I have the second alternate record key. So I have two alternates. One is the date the game occurred and the other one is the home team name. All right, let's scroll down a little bit. We have our file definition for our file. And now let's go down to the working storage area. In working storage, I actually wanna point out on line 41, I added a variable called read type. And what it is, is it allows me to declare some 88 level fields that will allow me to identify what type of search the user's trying to do. So if they type in the number one, I know they're going to try and search by game ID. If they type in a two, then I know they're going to use the date. A three, they're going to use the home team. And I added the number four to be able to just print out all the records that are in the file. Okay, I have two other working storage fields here. One is a date and one is the home team. Let's scroll down to the procedure division. In the paragraph 0100 start, the first thing I do is open the input file, and then I try and find out how does the user want to view the data. Do they want to select a record by date, or do they want to display all records? One thing I realized when I was working on this is if they choose a date, I still need to be able to retrieve more than one game, because as I said earlier, the date is not necessarily unique. There can be duplicates. So I had to account for that in my code. So let's scroll down a little bit. Let's go down to the part that checks for if the user is trying to retrieve records by date, starting on line 71. If they do want to search by date, they can enter the date. I move the date to the working storage date field, and then I read the input file, read baseball, and I identify the key that I want to use. And in this case, on line 77, I say the key is the date index. That's just my first priming read. Then I display that record if it's found. And on line 80, I say, okay, let me see if there's any other records that occurred on the same date. So I perform paragraph 200, read next date until end of file. So we'll scroll down to paragraph 200. And here we can see that the first thing I do on line 119 is to read the next record. So I read the next record. And what's really kind of unique about this is that it will read it in order of date because that's the key that I have set. When I reach the end of file, I will set the indicator. Then on line 122, it's going to read all the records and all the dates, but it's going to read them in order by the date index. 
So I did need to add a check on line 122 to say if the date that I just read matches the date that I'm searching for, then I'm going to display the record. Otherwise, I'm just going to ignore it. All right, let me show you how this works when I run it. So we can enter it by game ID or baseball code, or we can enter it by date. So let's do date first, and I'm going to enter in the date. All of them occurred in 2016, and let's go with October 19th. I'm going to extend the terminal window over to the left a little bit so we can see more of the records at one time. All right, we can see that there are two games that occurred on October 19th the Cubs versus the Dodgers, and the Indians versus the Blue Jays. All right, let's run it again. And this time, let's go ahead and print out all the records. So I'm going to put in a four. And I actually forgot to mention this, but I did have it set up so that it would index by the team name. So notice, if I scroll to the top, the team name here for the home team, the home team occurs second. So it starts with the Blue Jays. Then it goes to the Cubs, the Dodgers, and it prints them all out by order. Okay, we can run it one more time. And this time, let's go ahead and search by home team name. So it looks like we have Red Sox. So let me go ahead and put in Red Sox. And there's only one game for the Red Sox. And it looks like it was the Red Sox versus the Indians. So you can see by adding that index, it made it really easy for me to directly go into the file and get the information that I needed, either by date or by home team, or even by the game ID, which I called the baseball code. Okay, well, I hope you had fun with this activity, and don't forget that my solution code is available in the Exercise Files folder under Chapter 6. We've all seen the need for using Excel at one point or another, so we know the benefits of using a table. Here's an Excel table for a monthly budget. As you can see, we have columns representing each month of the year, and then we also have rows that show the income, the rent, the electric, the water and sewer, the groceries, and the cell phone. This is just sample data that I made up, but I wanted you to see that this is an example of what a table would look like. Tables consist of a table name and cells called table elements. For those of you that are familiar with Java or a similar programming language, you can think of a table in COBOL as an equivalent to an array. Let's switch over to Visual Studio. In this sample program, I have a file that contains the city name and 12 months worth of rainfall totals for each city. Each rainfall amount is a three-digit number with an implied decimal point. Let's take a quick look at the file. So rainfall.dat shows the city name followed by 12 occurrences of three numbers. So if we look at Houston, the January rainfall amount would be 3.8. Let's go back over to our COBOL program. To read each record in the file, I'm using a file description that includes the city name, but then I'm using a table for the rainfall amounts. The file definition starts on line 12, where we have FD rainfall file. Then on line 13, we have the elementary record 01 rainfall details, followed by the definition of the city name on line 15, followed by on line 16, the rainfall. Notice that I have a sublevel underneath rainfall, a 03 record that says rain amount, pick 99V9. Remember, it was a three digit value that was using an implied decimal point, and that's how we do that in COBOL. And that value occurs 12 times. By using that occurs statement, I avoid having to create 12 separate variables for the rainfall. Otherwise, for each record, I would have to have a January amount, a February variable, March, April, May, etc. But this way, I have one variable called rain amount, and we can reference it using a subscript to get at each of the rainfall totals for all 12 months. The advantages of this approach include the code clearly shows the unity of these table elements. You can use subscripts to refer to each of the table elements, and we can easily repeat data items. The occurs indicates the repetition of a data item. Tables are important for increasing the speed of a program, especially one that looks up records. This table is considered a one-dimensional table, but it is possible to have a two-dimensional table. All right, let's scroll down to the procedure division to see how we can read in this file. As you can see, in the 100 begin paragraph, on line 87, I open the input rainfall file. I read the first record, then on line 94, I perform process records. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit further so we can see the process records paragraph. 
Here I start by moving the city name to the working storage detail city. Then on line 100, I have a for loop, which in this case, since it's COBOL, we use perform varying the variable WS month from one by one until the month reaches the value 13. Once it reaches 13, it'll stop, so I, this will allow me to get the months 1 through 12. Inside the perform, I actually have the statement on line 102 that says move rain amount. Notice the syntax here. I have parentheses WS month close parentheses to the WS detail rain amount. Again, using parentheses and a variable inside the parentheses. That variable represents the subscript value, which will start at the value 1 and increase by 1 each time. So it'll start with 1, which represents January, 2 to February, 3 is March, etc. Once I've gone through and completed this one record and moved all 12 amounts to my detail record, then on line 105, I display the detail line. Then I read the next record. Did you notice that on line 103, the WS detail rain also is a table? So let's scroll up and take a look at the definition for that variable. Here on line 77, you can see we have WS detail amount occurs 12 times. Again, that's a table in COBOL. And inside that table, it has a two-digit filler, and then it's followed by the rain amount, which in this case, since I want to print it out, I don't use the implied decimal. I use 99.9 .9 because I want the decimal point to print. All right, I'm going to increase the size of my terminal window because when I run this, it'll display to the terminal. So let's take a look at what happens when we run this program. I already have this compiled, so I just need to run it. So I'll do dot slash tables. Let me make it just a little bit bigger. And you can see that for each city, it lists the rainfall amounts for January, February, all the way through to December. I hope you can see how useful tables were in this particular program. Tables are really helpful when you have multiple occurrences of data that have the same format. For example, if we wanted to read a file of quarterly sales for popular video games, we could read each record and save it in a table. This is different from the last activity where we read in the amounts and just printed them out. This time, we're going to save the data in a table for further processing. Then we can traverse the table to add up total sales by quarter or even search the table for the highest sales game in quarter one. To save time, I've already coded most of the program and it's available in the Exercise Files folder under Chapter 7. We need to create a table that can hold the incoming records from the input file. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to put it in working storage. So I'm going to create an 05 level that is going to be called Game Info. This represents one occurrence of a record of the incoming file. So it contains the information about the game, including the SKU number, as well as the game title, and the four quarters worth of sales. So this first part is going to occur 10 times because I have 10 records coming in. I'm going to create an elementary item below that that's going to contain the detail for this record. So it's going to be table SKU, which is four digits. So I'm going to do pick nine, four. Then I'm going to add the game title, and that is up to 20 different characters. So I'm going to do pick X, 20 followed by the quarterly sales. Oops, I spelled quarterly wrong. Let me fix that. There we go. Now, quarterly sales it actually has four different amounts. Each one is five digits long. So I actually need to create a table within a table. So even though the game info occurs 10 times, each game has four occurrences of the sales for that quarter. So let's go ahead and add another elementary level and this one can be the quarterly sales and it's going to each one is going to be five digits long and because the same thing the same data occurs four times i'm going to use the occurs clause as i stated at the beginning tables are helpful when we have multiple occurrences of data that have the same format and in this example the quarterly sales is the exact same format for each quarter this table is a little different because it is actually a two-dimensional table. The first dimension identifies the game. The second dimension identifies the quarterly sales. So for game one, we have four occurrences of sales, game two, etc. Let's scroll down to the procedure division and take a look at the code to process this table. 
Notice on line 86, I'm setting the game table subscript to 1. This is different from other programming languages such as Java or C++ or even C Sharp. In those languages, the array indexes usually start at position 0, but in COBOL, the first subscript value for the first record in a table is 1. So that's the first important thing that I wanted to point out. Now let's take a look at process records. Here in process records on line 94, you can see we're moving the SKU to the table SKU and we only need to give it one subscript value because there's only one SKU for each game. Same thing goes for the title. But now when I get to the quarterly sales, I need to move the quarterly sales coming in from the input file. And in, on line 97, I'm moving the quarter one to the table, but the table has to have two values as its subscripts. We have to identify the game. We're using the game table subscript for that. And then a one to indicate quarter one. On line 100, you see quarter two. Line 102 is quarter three. And line 104 is quarter four. And then I increase the subscript for the game table to go to and read the next record. As I stated earlier, for this example, what we're doing is we're reading all the records and we're putting them into working storage into a table. So at this point, I'm not going to print it out until I'm done reading the entire file. So when I'm done with process records, let me scroll back up. You can see I go down to line 88 where I actually display the details. So that performs paragraph 250. So if I scroll down and we can see in paragraph 250, in order to display the information, I need to move it from the table to the output line. And for anything that has a double subscript, that's a two-dimensional table on line 136, I need to provide both a subscript and the quarter. So I have quarter one, two, three, and four respectively. All right, let's go back up. After we're done displaying the details, now I'm going to use the table again to calculate the quarterly totals. So let's take a look at paragraph 220. Now paragraph 220 needs to start all over again with the very first game and then the four different quarterly sales. And I'm adding that value to a WS quarterly total. This allows me to keep track of a total quarterly sales for all games for quarters one, two, three, and four. Okay, I need to save this before I compile it, but I'm gonna save it as just create sales table, not create sales table start. That way you'll still have access to the create sales table start program to follow along with the video. So I'm gonna do file, save as, and I'm just going to take off the start and I'll click OK. OK, and now we'll compile this new version of the program. So COBC dash X create sales table dot CBO. All right, now we can run it. So dot slash create sales table. And I'm going to expand my terminal window so we can read the data a little bit easier. So let me just scroll this over to the left. And here we can see that it prints out the details for each game. And then at the bottom, it prints out the quarterly total for each quarter. As you can imagine, tables are widely used in all programming languages, so it's worth taking some extra time to practice using tables in COBOL. An important feature of COBOL is the ability to search tables. In COBOL, there's two search verbs, search and search all. By default, tables are searched sequentially. Tables can be either sorted or unsorted, but to use the search verb alone, a table must include the indexed by phrase. The program then starts the search at index 1 and continues until either the value is found or it reaches the end of table. The search all verb executes a binary search, and it requires a key is phrase. As with any binary search, the table must be in sorted order prior to the search. Using an index value increases the program efficiency when using the search verb. To demonstrate searching a table, I have a copy of the Create Table program. Let's go over to Visual Studio now. We want to update this program to allow it to search based on the SKU value. It's easy to ensure the table is sorted by adding either the word ascending or descending to the table declaration. I've already added two working storage fields, so let's scroll down to the working storage section. On lines 30 and 31, on line 30, I have a search key, and on line 31 is what I'll use to print out my search message whether the item was found or not found. Next, we need to update the table. The table starts on line 33, and we have game info occurs 10 times, and now I'm going to add ascending as the order in which I want the table to be sorted. Next, since I do want to use the search verb, 
I have to add key is, and the key that I'm going to use is the SKU value, so table SKU. And we'll say that this table is indexed by the game index. Notice the game index variable is only declared in the table definition. We don't need to add a separate working storage value for this field. All right, now let's scroll down and see where we have the code that will execute the search. So in the first paragraph here, we open the video file, display some titles, and then we display the message on line 94 that says enter search key. Whatever key the user enters will go ahead and search the game info table. If it reaches the end of the table, it's going to say not found. Otherwise, when the table SKU matches the search key, we will move the game title to our search message, and then on line 103, we'll print the results. All right, let's go over to the terminal window. I'm just going to make the terminal window a little bit bigger here. First, I want to go back over and save my search table start. I'm going to save it as just search table, so you have the other version to start with. And I'll click OK. And now in the terminal window, I want to compile that. So I'll do cobc x, and I'm going to compile search table.cbl. All right, that looks good. Now we can run it. So I'll do dot slash search table. Now over in the left, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the video file so I can look for some of the SKU values. So if I do open file, I can come down to video sales file. Over in the right, in my search window, let's go ahead and enter in 0163, which should be the LEGO Harry Potter video game. And it is. As you can see, it's pretty easy to, first of all, sort the table by just adding the ascending or descending to the table description in working storage. So let me scroll back up here. And also, to add the key is and the index by makes the table searchable. So you can either use the search or the search all. In this case, I did use the search all. All right, let's go back to the COBOL program. And we can see that it was pretty easy to add the ascending to our game info table to have it sort in ascending order. And then adding the key is and the index by made it easy to use the search verb. Now let's scroll down. I want to make sure you notice that we did use the search all this time. So we have on line 96, search all game info. So that automatically did a binary search for whatever key I put in. The way the binary search works is it splits the table in half, finds out if the key is greater than or less than the midpoint, and then depending on what it is, in this case it would have been greater than, it continues to split the table until it either finds the match or it prints out not found. For this challenge, we're going to search weather data. I've already created a weather2020.dat file that's available in your exercise files folder. This file was created using the Google BigQuery against the GSOD weather data. I used year 2020. The table contains weather information that was collected by NOAA. It includes information such as the amount of rain and wind speeds, etc. Your program should read the weather data file and store it in a table. From there, provide the user with the option of printing the entire table or for searching for a specific station number. So in order to search for a specific station number, you need to make sure that you add the station number as an index. Since I'm recommending that you just use the search verb, you don't have to make sure the table is in any kind of order, ascending or descending, although it might not be a bad idea. As an option, too, you can actually use the table to tally up the number of occurrences of maybe fog, rain, snow, hail, or thunder, and then print out the results. Also notice, in the file, I've actually converted the values 1 and 0 to be true or false, depending on whether or not it had fog or rain, etc. So in the weather2020.dat file, you'll see the words true and false for whether or not it did have rain that day. On the original data file, it only had a 1 and a 0. When you're done, Feel free to take a look at my solution to see how I address this problem. Have fun! How did you make out with the challenge for this chapter? So the, this chapter was concentrating on using tables. So let's take a look at my solution. So here you can see on line 7, I'm reading in that weather2020.dat file. On line 13 is the start of the record layout for this file. 
It included a station number, the month, day, year, a average temperature, and then true or false for whether or not there was fog that day, rain, snow, hail, thunder, or tornado. Now, I do want to mention that the data that I use is just the first hundred records that were retrieved from my Google BigQuery. And I believe most of the information that I retrieved in the first hundred records is from Canada. So you'll notice that there's a lot of days that had snow, but let's continue down. So in working storage, what I want to point out here is the table definition. So again, on line 43, we have weather info occurs a hundred times. And I did go ahead and assort it by ascending key is the table station. And then I had to use the index by so that I could actually use the search verb. So I'm doing index by the table index. My table contains the information that was on the file, station number, month, day, year, etc. And we'll scroll down to the procedure division. In the procedure division, I open my input file and I read the first priming record. Then I calculate the weather subscript. I started at 1. Remember that in COBOL, the subscript values start at 1 and not 0. And I process all the records. And that allows me to put all the records into a table. Then I allow the user to enter 1 if they want to see a full report, or 2 if they want to search by station number. Let me scroll down a little bit more. If they entered 1 for a full report, I go ahead and print out the heading lines, and then I print out the details. Otherwise, I perform a search. So let's take a look at the search, which is paragraph 260. So here in paragraph 260, once I know they want to do a search by station number, I ask them to enter the station number, and I accept that value. Then I search weather info, which is the table. At end, meaning that it didn't find one, I display that the station was not found. Otherwise, when the table station at table index is equal to the station number the user is looking for, I move all the values to the detail line, and then I print out the heading line followed by the detail line, so they can see the weather for that station. All right, let me go ahead and increase the size of my terminal window so I can run the program and we can see the results. So I'm going to do dot slash solution. And let's start with a full report. So I'll put in a one first. And we can see, let me scroll up a little bit so we can see our headers here. We can see that under snow, there are quite a few days that were true. And we can see that it snowed on quite a few days. So if I scroll down, we can see all the different values. The first value is whether or not there was fog. And it looks like these first 100 stations had fog every day. Then several of them had rain, snow, sleet, thunder, and tornadoes. All right, now let me run it again. And this time, we'll search by a station number. So this time, I'm going to do a 2. And let's enter in a station number that we can see above. I'll go ahead and enter in the top one there, 644620. And I hit Enter, and there's the information just for that one station number. And the data that I had was from March 19th. OK, well, that is my solution to this problem. Feel free to take a look at the file. It's located in your Exercise Files folder in Chapter 7 called Solution.cbl. When we define variables as alphanumeric, we often need to evaluate individual characters within the field. There are three string operations that I want to address, inspect, string, and unstring. This movie, I will show you an example that uses the inspect verb. The inspect verb can be used for counting characters in a string, replacing one group of characters in a string with another group, and even converting a set of characters to another set of characters, such as converting a string from uppercase to lowercase or vice versa. For this example, we're going to use a file of employees. The employee input file contains the social security number, followed by the name, the birth date, the gender, and an email address. In order to correctly format a report of all employees, I need to take the nine-digit social security number as input, and I want to print it using hyphens to format the number according to social security number standards. Let's switch back over to our COBOL program. In order to do that, we can use the inspect statement to add hyphens to our social security number to print a report. First, we're going to define a working storage variable that adds spaces where the hyphens should be. Let's take a look. You can see here on line 15 is the employee social security number made up of nine digits. If I scroll down to working storage, you'll notice in the detail line, I have on line 59 the social security number defined as 999 and a B, followed by 99, followed by another B, 
and then followed by the last four numbers of the Social Security number. What will happen is when I move the nine digit number to this field, the digits will replace all the nines and spaces will replace the Bs. Then we'll use the inspect verb to inspect this field for any spaces. And wherever there's a space, we'll put a hyphen. Let's scroll down a little more. We can take a look at the process records paragraph. Here on line 83 is the inspect verb, inspect SSN out, replacing all spaces by hyphens. I move the rest of the fields to the detail line, and then I display the detail line. Let's go ahead and run this program. I've already compiled it, so I'm just going to go ahead and run it, and it's called inspect start. There we go. We can see that it prints out the name in a nice format, and it prints out the social security number with three digits, a hyphen, two more digits, a hyphen, and then the last four digits, followed by the email. There is another feature of the inspect verb that we can also use in this program. It might be nice to double check that the emails have a valid email address. In order to make it valid, it has to have an at sign. As you can see in the report here, the very first one does not have that. And then I added two to Vincent Jones. You can see it says vjones at at email. We can add an inspect that will inspect the email address and look for an at sign. If it finds one and only one, it will go ahead and move the email to the output field. Otherwise, we'll replace it with the message saying invalid email. Let's go ahead and do that now. I'm going to add a call to a paragraph that will perform the validation of the email. So let's do 0250 validate email. And then I'm going to remove this line because I'll move the email to the detail email in this paragraph. So right here, I'm going to go ahead and do 0250 validate email. I have to move it over into the right column. And in this paragraph, I'm going to start by moving a zero to a working storage field called tally. Now I'm going to inspect the email field. Oops, I got to spell inspect right. Inspect email. And I'm going to use the keyword tallying, WS tally, for all. And I had to tell it what I wanted to count, and I wanted to count the number of at signs. If WS, WS tally is not equal to the number one, meaning there was either zero or more than one, then I'm going to move a message that says invalid email to the detail email. Else, that means it was valid. Now I can move the email field to the WS detail email. And I want to make sure that I end my if. So I'll do an end if. Notice the only period I have here is at the end if, because after the if statement, it will execute the move invalid email if the WS tally is not equal to one. Otherwise, I want to move email to the WS detail email. And that's the end of my end if. And now I can just put an end to the paragraph. So I'll do 0 to 50 end. All right, now let's go ahead and save this. I'm going to do control S. And on the right hand side, let's go ahead and compile it. So I'll do COBC dash X. Now, actually, I'm going to save this without the word start. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then I'll go back and take this back out so you have a starting point that does not have the changes that we made. So let me just do that. And OK, there we go. And let's go ahead and compile this one. So inspect.cbl. That looks good. Let's go ahead and run it. Awesome. Notice that there's two invalid emails. The very first one was the one that didn't have any at sign. And then Vincent Jones, a little ways down, says invalid email because that had more than one at sign. So you can use the inspect, as I said, to either count characters, to replace characters, and in our case, to even help with validating an email address. When working with alphanumeric fields in COBOL, it often is necessary to be able to combine some of the strings together. The string verb is used to combine strings, and this is also called string concatenation. In this program, we're reading a sequential file that again contains a list of employees with their last name, first name, and middle initial. Let's take a quick look at the file. You can see here the last name is right after the social security number, followed by the first name, followed by the middle initial. Let's go back over to our COBOL program. 
Using the string statement, we will format the name to be displayed as the first name followed by a space, followed by the middle initial, followed by a single space, followed by the last name. So to eliminate any extra spaces in the employee's name, we will also use the optional delimited by space to allow us to only get the name and not all the extra spaces that are allotted for longer names. So let's scroll down and take a look at the program. You can see here that the employee name is split up into 10 positions for the last name, 10 for the first name, and a single position for the middle initial. On line 41 in my WS detail line, the first elementary level is 05 WS detail name, and it has a total of 23 characters. But I don't want to just put the first name and the last name with all the extra spaces. I want it to look more like first name space middle initial period space last name. So let's scroll down to the process records paragraph and we can take a look at how we're using the string command. In the process records paragraph I still have the statement from the inspect movie on line 66 that allows me to replace a space with a hyphen so the social security number will print out as three digits hyphen two digits hyphen four digits. Below that I move spaces to the WS detail name because I don't want any part of the previous name to show up in the new name. And then on line 68 is where I'm using the string verb. So I string along the first name, let me move the cursor out of the way, delimited by spaces. So wherever the first space occurs after the person's name, that's the data that I'm going to get up until that space. Then I add a single space after first name then I go on to say it's delimited by size. Then I have the middle initial, delimited by spaces as well, followed by a period and a space. So, so far, I'm going to have the first name, space, the middle initial, period, space. And again, that's also the middle initial is delimited by size. And then followed by the last name, delimited by spaces, and another space, delimited by size. And I move that whole thing into the WS detail name, and then I display the WS detail line. All right, over on the right, I'm going to go ahead and compile this. So cobc x string.cbl. And now I'm going to go ahead and run it. As you can see, it starts with the first name, Danielle Corkery, and it has Danielle space f dot space Corkery. And you can see all the names now have the nice format of the first name, a single space, middle initial, followed by a period, followed by a single space, and then the last name. So you can use the string command to concatenate two or more variables that contain alphanumeric characters. The last string verb that I'd like to talk about is the unstring verb. The unstring verb in COBOL is used to divide a larger string into substrings. This is the opposite of the string command, which took substrings and merge them together or concatenated them together into one large string. Have you ever worked with a common delimited file? These files are often created from Excel and this type of file is a great candidate for the unstring verb. Common delimited files contain variable length data that's separated by commas. Let's take a look at an example of a common delimited file. Here I have an excerpt of weather data that I got from Google's BigQuery. This file contains data that's separated by commas. It starts with a station ID, followed by the month, day, and year, and then it has some information about the weather that occurred on that day. What I need to do is take this file and actually convert it from a comma delimited file to a regular data file that can be fed into a program that has fixed data sizes. And then it can create a report. So I'm going to use the comma delimited file as input, and then using the unstring command, I will parse the data and create a separate file that can be read into another program to print out the report. All right, let's take a look at our COBOL program to unstring the weather file. If we scroll down, we can see where we have the input file identified as weather, and the output file will be called new weather. If I scroll down, we have the weather file as just one large string coming in. On line 19, it's called details and it has a PIC X of 38. That file contains all the data separated by commas. And what I want to do is I want to take each piece of data and put it into a field for the file called new weather, which is defined on line 21, followed by line 22, which is the group item, which says weather record. And then I have all of the individual data items broken out. 
station, month, day, year, etc. Let's scroll down a little more. In working storage, I have fields defined for each of the individual pieces of data, and what I'll do is I'll read the input file, I'll unstring it into the working storage fields, and then move them out to my output file. On line 53 is an important variable, it's called string n, and I have it defined as pick 9999. That's the value that we're going to use as the starting point for the end of the file, and then we'll work our way backwards searching for commas to separate out each piece of data. So scroll down a little bit more. In our begin paragraph, we open the input file and the output file. We read the first input record, and then we process the records until end of file. I'm going to scroll down again so we can see all of the process records, or at least most of it. Here's how we do the unstring. So on line 72, we have perform varying string n from 100 by negative 1. Now 100 is more than I need, but just in case one of the records was longer than the others. So I have from 100 by negative 1. So I'm starting at the far right hand and I'm going backwards until the details record using this subscript string n for one position is not equal to a space and then I do an end perform. Then I unstring the weather details using the position 1 to the string n delimited by a comma and I put each field into the station, month, day, year, etc. and then I have the end unstring. So this code here will start at the end and it'll go all the way back and find each piece of data separated by a comma and put it into these variables. Let me scroll down a little bit more and we can see that we're moving the working storage fields into the new data fields. The one change that I do have here, though, on line 95, is the incoming record had a 1 for whether or not there was fog that day. I'm going to change that to true if there was fog, and I'm going to say false if there was no fog. And the same thing for rain, snow, hail, and tornado. Oops, I'm sorry, I missed thunder. And then at line 120, we write that new record out to our weather record and read in the next record. Let's go ahead on the right-hand side here and compile this. So I'll do cobc-x unstring weather.cbl, and now we can run it. Remember, when it runs, it's not going to give us a report here. It's just going to create the file that I need to feed into a report. Whoops, I typed that wrong. Let's try this again. Dot slash unstring underscore weather. There we go. I think I put .cbl, so it was trying to run the uh, COBOL file, but I really wanted to run the class file. Okay, let's open up the, we should see here that it created a weather2020.dat. Let's open that file. So file open, and there it is, weather20dat. And you can see that it took the commas out and replaced everything with the station number, the month, day, um, the year, as well as it changed all the zeros and ones to be true and false for whether or not there was rain, snow, hail, sleet. Sounds like I'm talking about the mailman. All right, so the unstring command, like I said, is a great tool for dealing with comma delimited files. One of the things that you need to be really careful about when you're either updating a COBOL program or writing one from scratch is your numeric overflow. If you're used to programming in Java or C++, this is especially true. So in this table here, I'm trying to demonstrate that an integer variable in COBOL, the size of that value is based on the pick clause. So if you only need the numbers 0 through 9, you can use pick 9. If you need 10 to 99, you can use pick 99. And then 100 to 999 can be pick 999. Now as the numbers get increasingly larger, you can start to use your COMP3 variable types, and that will give you much larger numbers. But if you just need an integer, you can actually define the pick clause accordingly. In Java, if you define an int variable, you automatically have the size of from minus 2 to the 31st all the way up to 2 to the 31st minus 1. So you really don't worry too much about numeric overflow in Java, and in C++, it actually, a regular integer variable goes from minus 32,000 all the way to 32,000. So it's not as much of a big deal in Java or C++ as it is in COBOL. Let's switch over to Visual Studio, and I want to show you an example of how easily it could be to have an overflow issue, but there's no errors that get produced and actually just makes your output incorrect. So let's take a look. I'm starting with the program from the Chapter 8's 
challenge and solution, this program takes in a comma delimited file called customers and creates a mailing report. Well, I actually changed the customers.csv to add an email address. That makes the file much longer because we don't necessarily know how long everybody's email address will be. So I'm going to change the size of the file on line 18 from 61 to 100. And now I'm going to scroll down because I need to make sure that when I unstring each record that I don't start at 61 but that I start at the very end of the file which is now 100. So I'm going to change that value as well. All right, so now that I have those two changed, it seems pretty straightforward. Let's go ahead and save it. I'm going to do Control S, and over on the right, I'm going to compile it. All right, it compiled successfully, so now let's run it. Unstring error. All right, it ran, and it created mailing.lpt. Let's take a look at the file. Okay, now that is not going to work very well for a mailing label. And again, no error messages, nothing seems wrong, and it can be really frustrating to try and figure out why it's not working. But if you look carefully here on line 61, I'm perform varying the variable string end, it starts at 100, and I subtract one each time. Well, let's look at the working storage definition for string end. And you can see here, it only has pick 99, but when I change the file size from 61 to 100, I need to change this as well. I need to make sure that it can hold the value 100. So what was happening was in my paragraph here for process records, it was actually starting from zero by negative one, and then it went ahead and tried to execute the program. Uh, the comma was there because of the city, state, and zip, because I actually put a comma into the file down here on line 83. You can see I have a comma being added to the output file. All right, well, I made that change now. Let's save it, Control S, and I'm gonna go over to the right, and I'm gonna compile it again. And then I will run it again, and let's see if we fixed our error. So let's go to our mailing report. <laughs> there we go, that looks much better. And so I just wanted to point that out because watching out for numeric overflow is easy to forget. And if you define the very minimum value for all your pick fields, you, sometimes you might not have a value that can handle the overflow. I don't want to recommend making all numeric values very large because in COBOL, extra space means extra processing, which means extra time, which means extra money. So you want to make sure that you're using the right size, but just be cognizant that if you do have some type of numeric value or if you're doing computations, you might want to make sure that all your numeric fields are defined with enough space to handle the calculations. For this movie, I intentionally have errors in one of my programs, and I want to show you the process to problem solving. It compiles and it runs, but it does not work correctly. The idea for this program is to read in a file of employees called testdata.dat. Each employee has an SSN number, a name, some other information, along with an email address. And you can see that there are a few invalid email addresses. The first one does not have an at sign. The second from end has two at signs, and the very last one has 11 at signs. So they should print out as invalid email. All right, before we start to look for the errors, let's run the program and see what happens. So I'm going to make sure I compile it. So I'm going to do a cobc dash x and problem solve start dot cbl. All right, so that worked. Now let's run it. Oops, I spelled something wrong. Oh, I forgot the slash. There we go. All right, well, that really doesn't look too good, does it? It's odd. The first two look okay, but then when it gets down to Dolores Kingston, there's an extra space there and just everything else gets all kind of messed up. And then at the very bottom, there is a error on the file, a status code 46. All right, so if you saw something like this, especially with the way the output is being presented, the first thing that I would do would be look at the way that I have the file defined as the input, because I have seen this before. All right, so if we look at our file, we can see that our file, remember it's line sequential because each record is on its own line. Sequential would mean that there was one record of a fixed size followed by another record, and they would all be on line one. But in this case, it's line sequential. So if we look at our program, that's our first error. So on line eight, I need to add the word line sequential. I'm gonna go ahead and save it. I'm going to compile it again. 
and let's see right there and it compiled okay and let's run it again and see where we're at all right well that definitely fixed the format of the input so that looks much better we're down here at the bottom half of the screen in the terminal window so it looks like it printed everybody okay um, we have the invalid email for danielle and the invalid email for vincent jones but what's odd is that sean walsh does not have an invalid email message so we'll have to look at that but the next thing that i'd like to look at is the error status of 46. the error status 46 if you look it up it says that a subsequent read operation has been tried on a file that was open in input mode but it received a not valid because a prior read encountered an end of file okay well that kind of tells me that it read through all the records and that makes sense because sean walsh is the last one but then it tried to read for another record so somehow my program is not hitting that end of file or if it is hitting it it's still trying to read another record after it does that so let's scroll down to where we do the read remember normally we do a priming read and then we go ahead and read all the employees so this could actually be caused from two problems if we look at the program, starting on line 68 is my begin paragraph. I go ahead and open the input file, then I process all the employees. But because I don't have anything to tell the compiler and the program where to go next, it goes ahead and drops back into the paragraph 0200 on line 72. COBOL is a sequential programming language, so it just reads through and lets it's redirected. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we perform after we're done and we've reached the end of the file, we need to perform 0300, right? That's our stop run. Now, if we go ahead and save this and run it again, let's see where we're at. Okay, I'm gonna compile it and I'm gonna run it. Well, we got rid of our end of file error, but what's happening here now is you'll notice that it's still trying to print out an extra record. So let's look at our program again. So on line 70, we perform process records until end of file. Well, when it comes down to line 75 to read the next employee, if it hits end of file, it sets end of file to true, but it still goes ahead down to line 78 and tries to print out another record. That's why we get that junk there that we see under, underneath Sean Walsh. So let's go ahead and let's move things around a little bit. Let's move this down to the end. So that way it won't try and display an employee when it reaches the end of file. But when I do that, I do need to actually add a priming read so that we'll read the very first record up here in the begin paragraph. And then it can go ahead down to the paragraph 200 and process the rest of the records. I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna compile it and I'm gonna run it. Okay, that's much better. Let me just scroll over so you can see. All right, it looks like it actually is processing all the records correctly. The last thing that I noticed is that it's still not telling me that Sean Walsh has an invalid email. And so let's take a look. It looks like it's counting. If I go down to validate email, it's counting all the at signs and it's putting the count into the variable called WS tally at sign. That's really strange because on 91, it says if the at sign count is not equal to one, and in this case, Sean has 11, it is supposed to put invalid email. Well, that means that we need to take a look at the size of the WS tally at sign variable. I've mentioned this before, but you don't get an error in COBOL if you overflow a numeric variable. So right here on line 33, at the WS tally at sign was set to just one digit, meaning zero to nine. So what happened was Sean had 11, it truncated off the one and it thought that it only had one. So let's make this bigger so that it can handle, I'm just gonna go ahead and put three. That way if they put 999 at signs, we're still okay. All right, let's save this, let's recompile and we'll run it again. Hey, there it is, Sean has an invalid email and it looks like, let me stretch this over a little bit so it's easier to see. Okay, now we have all the invalid emails correctly. It prints out the name and the social security number with the dashes. Everything looks good. So I hope this helped to identify where to look if you encounter some of these common problems. Thanks for coming with me as this journey through time when we went back to learn more about COBOL. As you continue to learn COBOL programming, there are a few sites or resources that might come in handy. The first one that I recommend is the GNU COBOL guides that are available 
here at the GNU COBOL.SourceForge.io. Next, IBM has a whole knowledge center that has many different resources, but there is a programming guide for COBOL. And one other thing that I didn't talk about in this course, but definitely would be a good skill to have when it comes to COBOL programming, is to learn more about how to connect to DB2. DB2 is IBM's database that you can use with COBOL.